Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is an exclusive story from a brand new author by the name of K.B. Michaels, a.k.a. Azra Ali. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. The Black Dragon's Night. Let's get straight into that. Chapter 1. Alvania. Blood and steel have gone silent as the battlefield lay empty now, but death spread its bony hand across the land, even though the war had been over for years now. Rot slowly infested the northern kingdom of Alvania, and untold horrors have now made it their home. No one knows what brought the demons, their numbers total in thirteen. And those who know of their existence and remain alive know them as the generals of descent, ushering in the most foul of cursed monsters upon the kingdom. Darkness slowly corrupts the land and tortures the people in the remote parts of the kingdom. Adventures have taken up the sword as the old king Feldrin has passed, and his son, Prince Alvarian has ascended to the throne, and where most thought his elder sister, Princess Phileas, would have taken over, she did not do so. No, instead she remained as head of the Holy Knights of the Goddess of Waster, rooting out the evil plague in the land without support from the royal army. To dismay for those who are being plagued, the new king doesn't seem to care, dismissing them as rumour, as he is busy changing the kingdom's laws to suit himself. However, even though the king does not move, venturers from far and wide have come to earn coin, glory, and perhaps fame. And that does not mean it is the only thing that drives a person to take upon themselves to hunt the general of the Santo, their master. And clad in black, a nightmare for these horrors rides through the land, bringing justice and vengeance at the same time. These are the tales of a dark knight who once was thought dead, travelling with his companions in arm. Their goal is not glory, honour, or even to save the souls of the damned. It is to bring a swift, violent end to the demons and place their master in the ground. Ivor ran as fast as he could through the woods. The chilling, echoing howls chased after him as the mist crawled around the ground. He couldn't even see five feet in front of him. Not that it would have mattered at this time. There were originally eight of them, all experienced adventurers of varying natures. They had met in the kingdom of Alvania, and knew that the money was worth a team-up. The small town of Viagra was being plagued by a beast that was proven to be a massive problem to the locals, even said to have killed a few people in the process. They brought along two hunters, figuring it was probably some bandits or some kind of wild pack of dogs of some kind. That should have been easy, but he knew something was wrong from the moment they got to the little remote town. The townspeople, when they seemed so defeated, trying to avoid them. One old woman who the villagers tried to silence and were acting crazy, shouting they need to leave before it was too late. Benit, a swordsman, encouraged them to ignore the woman. They could handle anything that came their way. The idiot was wrong. The biggest sign something was wrong was the chapel in the centre of the town, which looked as if all the windows were boarded up and abandoned long ago. It seemed as if the townspeople would stop praying to the gods. However, Nothing could have prepared them for what had happened, or what was about to happen to them. They ignored everything, and now they were paying the price. And the night had started off so hopeful, until the silence fell over the forest. Everything became silent before the bloody bay sound reverberated through the forest. It sent a chill through everyone and fear took hold of them. The hunters said something in their native language, and ran fast from the clearing that they had set up in. The others didn't even have time to stop them, or even register what they were talking about. And Ivor caught something about wolves. And everything went silent 
as the mournful moon rose high above them before the chill fell over everything. The dead silence was more nerve-wracking as if nature was holding its breath. Just as the mist started to rise over everything, that's when they heard the screams that echoed through the dark. And they knew who the screams belonged to. And the hunters didn't make it out alive. Benitz lit a bonfire, told them to stand fast, and that all they had to do was stay together, that the lions would keep the beasts back. And that didn't help as fear gripped hold of them when one of the hunter's head came flying out of nowhere and landed with a sickly squishing noise into the flames, sending embers everywhere. Benitz panicked and let his anger get a hold of him as he taunted the beast, thinking he could take it. And no, that was probably the dumbest thing that he could have done. They thought it was a simple beast, dumb, and that he didn't know who it was dealing with. And they were wrong, and the burning head told them everything they needed to know now. This beast was intelligent, and Benit didn't get it still. No, the warrior was the first to die. Yang straight into the darkness, and they could hear Benit being ripped apart. His screams echoed in their ears and seemed to go on forever. And then, it was over. Silence fell back over them. They knew that it had to make sure that his death was painful, that he paid for his arrogance. The others, like him, thought they could wait it out, wait till dawn, and that was also a mistake. First, it took out the flames, throwing what seemed like a log or part of a tree at the fire and causing it to erupt in embers, leaving them in the dark. This disoriented them, creating panic. He tried to tell them to stay together, but they didn't hear Ivor. No one ever listened to poor Ivor. The screams came one at a time. He lit a torch and abandoned his weapon. It wouldn't do him any good. The bloody thing was fast. It watched as one by one the remaining five of them were taken. Two ran off in one direction, while the other ran in the complete opposite direction of each other, further into the forest. And as he turned, he saw one of the men running into the darkness get swooped up into the darkness and taken into the trees. Ivar felt pure fear. Unable to see into the inky blackness, but he could hear the screams and the terror of flesh. The screams slowly came to an end, and with a gurgle, as he could hear the blood filling his fellow adventurer's lungs. What was that man's name again? Thomas? Trey? Or something with a T? Well, he wasn't close to the man, and he was kind of annoying, but he didn't deserve to die like this. But Ivan wasn't going to die for him, either. He turned and ran, but not deeper into the forest. Ivor was smarter than the others. There was no way in hell they could get far enough out of this thing's territory. Not by dawn. No, this thing hunted at night. They should have found it during the day. The gold? It wasn't worth this. It wasn't worth all of their lives. He decided the best action wasn't to escape, but to get back to the village. That, or that was where he could barricade himself in. The villagers could help him. When the sun came up, he could get a horse and get more help. He was sure that this was the way. When every so often he heard the screams of the others before silence took everything once more, he could swear he could hear his heart pounding, echoing through the dead of the night. Every time he heard a bush move, a twig snap, he spun, sticking a torch out in front of him. He saw nothing, not that he could ever see anything in the mist. The howl split the air again, closer this time, reverberating through his chest and echoing through his bones. He screamed in fear and ran hard, tripping over his own feet and stumbling into town. He could almost weep as he gave thanks to the gods for making it this far. But where were the lights, the torches, or anything? The town was a deathly silence. Not a single peep, the houses strangely dark. Hello? Anyone here? Ivor screamed, stumbling into the nearest house and trying to push it open. The door was secured and locked as he was pounding on the door. And then he thought he heard a low growl coming from behind him. He whipped the torch around, wide expecting to see the creature lurking behind him. Ivor swore he saw a shadow in the mist run down between the building. Ivor tried to push on the door once more, banging and pleading, but it wouldn't budge. No one came. He heard it again, almost as if it was above him, scraping claws against the rooftop, watching from above. He scrambled away from the door and looked up, waving a torch in front of him. Nothing was there, though, and his eyes darted back and forth. Nothing was there. 
Was his mind playing tricks on him, or was the fear? All the hair stood up on the back of his neck, and that's when he remembered. The church. It was in the center of town, and that was where he headed now, charging down the street, still taken in that no one was there. They all probably locked themselves up in their homes, protecting themselves, safety in numbers. Sweat poured down his face, and fear gripped a hold of him as he ran his hand through his long black curly locks, and he started to run towards the center, stumbling every so often, twisting in fear, and hearing a grouse echo through the silent town. The beast was teasing him, taunting him by moving in the shadows and through the mist. As he approached the chapel, there was a strange comfort of seeing it just for a moment. He relaxed. He shambled to the doors and began pounding on the doors. Let me in, please, Ivor shouted, his pounding against the door. To his surprise, it creaked open, but to his awe and shock, all he could see was the pitch black. Hello? Where are you? A warm breath welcomed him instead, smelling of blood and death. The glowing red eyes pierced the darkness, staring deep into his very soul. Ivor smelt piss as the warm liquid ran down his legs as he turned to run, screaming at the large clawed hairy hand that shot out, grasping hold of his head, and he was yanked from his feet and dragged into the pitch darkness. It didn't take long, as his screams were silenced, and the horrified howl of triumph echoed deep into the night air. Chapter 2 Darkest Night Let's get straight into that. Vanessa ran as fast as she could. Her heart pounded so hard, she was only in her twelfth year, but she had already been brave for coming this far. She had been careful, though, and she had slipped out during the new moon, and a storm to cover her scent. She had been on the road for a month now, trying to find anyone who would listen to her, but it fell on deaf ears. The guards from the closest town told her to mind her business, and said if she needed help, she needed an adventurer. However, there was no help at all, since the adventurers all gathered in the capital. Lucky for her, she had enough to get supplies, and none tried to convince her not to leave, but to stay with her, so she would not end up like her parents. But Vanessa knew they needed the help, and the wards wouldn't hold out for long. But the old woman made sure to give her gold and supplies for the long journey, wishing she could have gone instead. And no, Nan was too much of a staple in the community, within the town. They would have noticed her missing immediately, but not Vanessa. She had stayed mostly indoors, as she couldn't stand them. They were responsible for their death. And Nan tried to save them all, but they, her parents, sacrificed themselves to save the two of them. She had no choice. She had to find help. She left the city, not taking a chance to wait. She had to let them know. They all came, but never listened. It was a death trap for those adventurers who had come to slay the beast, but they all failed. They all died. None of them listened to her nan when they came. If she could get to the city, she could find the guild and update the information, and maybe find someone that could handle the situation. Hell spell, she thought. Maybe even get the king to send an army to handle them. Even as much distance as she had put between herself and the town, the full moon did nothing for her fear. She was a good woodsman herself. Her father had taught her to hunt and survive in the woods before. It became no longer safe. She sat close to the fire that night, before she heard it. The deep, reverberating shrieks turning into a monstrous howl. They shouldn't have been able to find her, but she was wrong. I couldn't be them. She had thought, moving closer to the fire, trying to escape the cold. She had been wrong, though. She shouldn't have thought that she could escape. She should have just run as soon as she heard those mournful howls. Now, she was running through the woods. Her heart was pounding within her ears and sweating hard, gasping for air. She held onto her side, barely escaping as the claw caught her side. Vanessa couldn't take the time to check herself. They had come so fast, catching her off guard, but the eagerness had played to her advantage. They looked like massive wolves at first glance, pitch black fur, green eyes and massive bodies that dwarfed the young girl. But it was not a wolf as they didn't have paws for the forelegs. Instead, long razor-clawed fingers, and they bare their massive serrated fangs. 
one of them raised as bones popped and cracked as it stood to its haunches, and two more came out to its side. Slobber and drool ran down their moor. She could tell was smiling at her. Run, rumbled out from its throat as the others had that look in their eyes. Vanessa didn't wait, feared that threatened to entangle her, never took hold as rage and adrenaline pumped through her veins. She tossed the special flash powder her nun had made for her. The powder exploded and a flash of lightning lit up the entire area. A few herbs causing smoke to bellow out allowed her to run as fast as she could. Just what the hell would she go though? Maybe hide? No. She realized as a sharp pain exploded into her side. It burned as she looked down at her hand holding her side. And it was bloody. It wouldn't take them long to find her scent again. The herbs had helped mask her own scent, but with this much blood, it wouldn't take them long to find her. She cursed under her breath for her foolishness. And she was slowing down as she pressed herself against the tree to try and catch her breath. The howl erupted over the air and echoed through the forest, followed by the dark symphony of the others in different parts of the forest. She couldn't pinpoint from where as everything spun around her, and she slid away from the tree. She had a crack as something was approaching her, and fear pumped through her veins as she growled to herself. Stand up, stupid. Nan, Nan needs us. And she pulled a doll out, grabbing hold of it close to her as tears slowly crept down her cheek. She was going to die, and she fell to her knees. And she looked down as she closed her eyes as the hand shut out, gripping her and covering her mouth as she yelped. Those amber eyes stared into hers from the shadows of the wide brim hat as he hissed out, Quiet, lest you wish them to find us. Do you understand? And she nodded slowly, as bandaged hands moved back, and she turned to see the young-looking man, who was maybe a little taller than her. He was decked out in a red long coat and a wide brim hat that was slightly torn, allowing enough light to hit the young face. The left hand was bandaged with strange writing along it, nothing that she could understand or had ever seen before. His silver hair spilled out over his shoulder, and his frame was slender. And from how he gripped her, what she was seeing seemed like a lie. She gripped the doll and asked, Who are you? Kai, who are you? Where are your parents? They're dead. They've been dead. Are you an adventurer? I have to save her. I have to... She started to say as she heard the howl, closer than it had been before. They're gonna kill us. You have to go. Please. Tears came flowing as she stared at a young man. Her hand reached out, gripping his coat, as she stumbled forward. Kai caught her and looked at her side. He cursed underneath his breath as she was breathing hard. His long ears caught the sound of something. It was no longer safe to stay there. He gripped hold of her, sweeping her off her feet. His keen sense could pick up that they, these beasts, were already catching the scent of blood. And if he had been human, he couldn't hear the branches breaking off in the distance, feel the tremble of the ground. The beasts were coming, and they were coming faster than he could run. Something pulled at him as his eyes scanned towards the left, and his feet followed. And there was a whisper on the wind. This way, hurry! For Kai, he already knew who the tiny female voice beckoning him was. He knew she had no power to help him in this particular manner. These beasts were not natural, and they wouldn't obey her command, even if she tried to intervene. And he could hear the beating of hooves against the ground, leading him to somewhere safe. She had never steered him wrong before. As Shirax was one of the older goddesses, there was less worship within Alvania, but held a special place in many forest worshippers. Her power laid in protection and the balance within the forests around the world. The fact that she would even step in could only mean one thing, that this child in his arms was connected to her. And she rarely spoke, especially to one such as himself, one tainted by chaos. Kai was not normal, even for an elf. Even now as the blood dripped onto his bandage, he could feel the cursed arm reacting to it, screaming to be set free. Not to worry about the girl, but his mind held strong against the ravenous chaos. The part of him that had been corrupted still demanded to be set free, bringing death in his wake. And it was part of the experiments done to him, his people, in the name of progress to someone of upper nobility. He had been saved, or at least spared the horrible fate of the rest of the villagers. 
That was when that man had arrived, or rather, that death had come to relieve them of their burdens. Those green eyes that glowed, that black armoured warrior who didn't hesitate. There was no hesitation in the blade, not like anyone had ever seen before. Every villager that had turned into monsters were cut down along with the so-called guards. The professor had vanished before, but he still remembered what the black knight had said to him when the blade reached Kai. You still have your soul intacted. Do you want vengeance, or do you want that bit of humanity to grow? He never once regretted his decision all of those years ago, as he watched the bodies burning in the hidden hovel. The now empty village still remained as a reminder of their graves and what had been done to them. Now, somehow, the toxin of evil that was spreading across the land had affected this little girl bleeding to death in his arms. There was no time to heal her wounds, as those hounds would be on him soon. Kai then heard the echoing howl of victory right behind him, as the savage slobbering beast tore through the trees. He could hear the ripping of branches as the massive hulking form blotted out the moonlight that managed to flicker through the branches and leaves. Kai couldn't dodge, but there was no time, as he pulled the girl tight to his chest, trying to protect her as best he could. He knew those razor-sharp claws would rip death into flesh, maybe tear him apart, but that wouldn't stop him, as he wouldn't let these bastards have one more bite at him. Its gleaming, glowing eyes stared down at them as it made a guttural growl, as its hunger got the best of the beast. The interfering little man smelled delicious. It was a two for the price of one. The creature thought as his long canine snout opened, revealing a row of sharp fangs. It drew back its hand and drove the dagger-like claws forward, threatening to grab hold of Kai. However, the shield came out of the dark and slammed into its arm, out to the side. While its open mouth was not rewarded with flesh, but with a flaming torch slamming down its gullet. Letting out a hurt whimper, the beast rolled to the ground, thrashing at its snout. Kai turned and saw a figure holding a shield with a torch, as a long red-black ponytail whipped in the wind, along with a tattered scarf. That way, now, the man said, pointing to his left. Van had been traveling through the woods at the time, and he'd be settling down for the night. He had tied down the might black war horse, removing the black metal barding, with horns coming out from the chaffron, giving it a very unearthly look. But there was a silver lining along the edges of the pieces of plates, along with engraved swirls and patterns on them. However, even before the sun had gone down, Van had felt that there was something not right as the hair on the back of his neck stood on edge, and he had learned to follow those instincts. He didn't just prepare the main fire near him and sleep near, but had set up several bundles to light just in case. He normally didn't like bedding down on a roll in his armor, but had decided to remove the chest piece and his ornate helmet. He left the greaves and gauntlets on, along with a tattered red scarf wrapped around the lower part of his face. And just as he'd finished his meal, the moon had started to rise, when he heard the unearthly howls. Fear did not grip him, as he could feel the blood within his veins starting to pulse as he stood from his resting spot. His eyes slowly started to take on that green hue, and he could sense them even now. The mighty warhorse let out a snort, not even bothered by the unearthly howls. Van calmly stood as he decided what to take with him. They are coming. He recognized the voice as it echoed in his mind as he gripped a hold of the kite shield from the ground. It was like the rest of his armor, black with a silver lining running along it, leading to a red gem. He also gripped hold of the torch, lighting the crimson flame and took his time lighting the other spots he had prepared, allowing more light into the area. And he could sense the beasts. They were low-level runs, but they had the arc demon curse flowing through their veins. It was a wretched feeling, as if some kind of black sludge threatened to swallow everyone around them. It revolted him, dragging him back to that day. His anger filled every part of his being, fueling his muscles. And Van moved through the forest, knowing sleep near would be just fine. As he moved through the bush, he could sense another presence, as it was familiar to him. The truth was, there was more than just one he recognized. The beast was near as he heard its mighty howl, and he could hear the feet running through the bushes near him. 
Instinctively, he darted through the brush and swung the shield out, slamming the beast's arm out of the way and thrust the torch into its mouth. The beast was sent flying to the ground as he pointed towards his encampment, and he shouted to Kai, That way, now! And Varn's eyes were ablaze, eyes glowing with a deep forest green now, as he turned his attention to the strange wolf creature that was clawing at his burnt snout. He turned following after Kai and growled out, You bring the most interesting friends. Who is the girl? Now is not the time for that. He isn't alone. Kai shouted as he ran past the first bundle of fires, laying her on a bedroll near the massive horse. Of course it wasn't alone. Varn already knew that. The glow of the red eyes could be seen at the edge of the fire line in the trees. There was at least two more with the beast, travelling like a pack and he could hear the growling. Can you save her? Varn asked, throwing the torch into the main fire pit while moving towards the massive wrapped object against the tree. They were being smart as the eyes vanished and disappeared into the darkness. I don't know, but she's lost a lot of blood, and I will need to focus. Can you keep him off my back? Kai asked as he recognized how stupid of a question that had been. Varm was already pulling the cloth away from the ridiculous massive two-handed black blade while letting out a grunt in response. The hilt was protected by what looked like intricate basket hilt that twisted around it. The elf could hear them moving about spreading out into different positions to attack. If he had been human, he could easily have lost them, but they had picked the wrong person to attack. Maybe it had been instinct on their part, but the beasts were probably fighting over if they could take the man standing before them. A chuckle emerged as a gravelly voice spoke out from the darkness. You are going to pay for that little stunt with the torch. I am going to tear your insides out and make you watch as I eat you slowly. Varn moved close to the fire, propping the blade against his shoulder with ease. And here I thought I'd get past the insults and procrastinating of your ass. Look, if you're looking for a good fucking, you've come to the right campfire. I'm positive my sword will satiate that need of you and your little buddies. Foolish little man, just because you have that... You think that it is going to... Oh, what the hell? The beast was cut off as the dagger flew near its head. What did I just say? Why don't you lot just come on out and get this fucking over with? It's been a long ride and I'm not in a mood for foreplay. The leader that had led them hadn't even seen him pull the dagger free. It didn't matter though. It still had no effect on them. Not since they had been blessed. So why was he hesitating now? The others were hungry, and they would be rewarded. And that was all that mattered. Foolish, lingering thoughts and fears of a past life that didn't exist anymore. And Van let out a short whistle as if calling a dog. <whistles> Come on, boy. Come on, you can do it. Mm, this man needed to be taught a lesson. Letting a guttural howl, the beast charged forward, and they would kill this man slowly and kill the girl bring back the elf's heart and balls of the human as trophies for their master. This would be a good night indeed. And the other echoed the first beast's howl as it penetrated the entire forest, shaking the very ground with their mighty roars. Kai gritted his teeth and brought his right hand around as he channeled the earth energy from the ground. As a golden light spiraled around his arms, bringing down onto Vanessa, the warm light started to flow over the wound muscles and flesh began to pull itself together. However, the left arm felt like it was on fire, as the burning chaos felt molten, lava coursing through him. He gritted his teeth and growled through it, and he was most vulnerable when he used his power to heal. And two of the creatures seemed to feel his vulnerability, as they were scrambling out of the woods directly at Kai. Vaughn moved without hesitation as he pulled the blade around, and moved with a speed that seemed unnatural, as he was still holding a massive blade. His muscles screamed as he twisted about, taking a deep breath in as the blade connected, smashing into the side of the first beast and slicing through muscle, breaking bones it had in its path and cutting past the spine. It may have slowed the broad black blade down, but it continued through the second one. The beast could not react fast enough, but it had missed its body, catching a lower part of his extended snout, 
and tearing through it. It rolled forward as it experienced something it had long forgotten. The searing pain erupted as blood gushed out, and its hand scrambled to its face, filling the wagon tongue hanging out. And as it rolled around, shock took hold, and it turned to look up in time to see the massive blade come down once again, cleaving down into its head and down through its body. Blood spluttered out, soaking the ground with its black blood pooling around it, and Varnick so, kicking the remains of the corpse towards the flame. The smell of fur burning filled the air as the loud crackle could be heard, coming from the body, almost igniting unnaturally. Van scanned the line and slid his feet apart, waiting for the leader to come out. The beast merely smiled, thinking how foolish the man was. And sure, the damage seemed massive, but it was nothing, as his brothers would stand in a few moments. This man was dangerous, but they would wear him down soon enough, and he would go in for the kill. Patience was all that was required for this. What was taking them so bloody long? Why was the other letting himself burn for so long? The beast grew impatient as it slammed itself into a tree, causing it to crack and fly towards Vaughn. The knight saw it coming towards him as he took off to the side to avoid the fallen timber. And as he did, the beast charged forward, darting at Vaughn, clawed hand extended to bite deep into the throat. Well, there was a slight click, and then the hand was sent flying in the opposite direction. The massive blade fell to the ground with a thud as a long, thin, double-edged blade replaced it, and the beast landed behind Van, growling as it burned. Now, the arm wasn't growing back. In fact, it was actual black blood dripping down to the ground. The beast snarled and tried to swipe at Van, ignoring the elf now. Its crimson eyes seemed to glow as the rage exploded within the beast. The sword whipped about, slashing the beast across its chest, biting deep as blood erupted forth. And Van was already pushing forward, and the beast tried to bite him. The armored hand shot up like a shield, blocking the bite. It pushed forward, trying to drag him down to the ground, while the other clawed hand shot out towards the unprotected stomach. But the strength that that man possessed didn't fit his stature or size. Instinctively, the beast let go without following through, jumping back as it did so. The gravel voice growled out, What the piss are you? You could say that I am death. Van replied calmly and pulled a short sword out from his side as he flipped the sword so that the point was downward and the smirk crossed his lips. And since I answered your question, you can answer mine. Do you lick your own asshole like most ducks? You enjoy it, don't you? The creature snarled in rage and charged in at Van. The knight swung the long blade at him, which the beast started beneath it while coming up at him. The short blade came upwards instead and slashed along the side of the snout, over the eye. And like the long blade that had cut him earlier, the wound was burning, as if acid had been poured on it. Could the blade be blessed? No, this was not something that had been blessed by something else that wasn't wiser. It was much more violent, something ancient about it. The beast could taste it in the air, reeking and coming off of this man standing before him. More important, the creature understood that this man knew how to fight. Mm, someone from the war. An ex-soldier or mercenary that had seen lots of combat. It's good I saw the glowing light, no longer able to smell blood coming from the girl. That moment of distraction was what Van needed, though, and he was already moving in, drawing the blade upwards with a slash. It bit deep again, but the creature charged in at him, trying to bite him, at least to end his life in the process. But that was cut off sharply as the short sword came up into the bottom of its snout and straight into the brain. Van didn't hesitate as he yanked it and the short blade straight back, slashing through the skull. Its body hit the ground with a thud and Van flicked the blood from the short sword before placing it back into the sheath. I think that's all of them. It was indeed, a female voice said as a deer emerged from the woods. Oh, you, Van said, as he made his way over to Kai. Is the little girl going to live? And falling back, he looked over to Van, shaking his head. I have no clue. She lost a lot of blood before I even had a chance to heal her. What is a little girl like this, this young, doing in a forest alone? She has to be one of your followers. Kai looked to the deer. 
And Shirax nodded and said, Yes, but I do not recognize this child. I don't know where she came from, but I know she was in danger. And by the time I'd found her, she was already in your arms, Kai. And since I know that a Black Knight was here, I figured he could deal with the beasts. And Vance led the sword back into the other blade and spat to the side. I don't deserve you, or any of the damn gods. But you belong to her, and you do kill these things with a passion. None of the other ancients understand what drives you, but you are doing us all a favor. Even if the others don't appreciate you, I recognize you for the things you do. Van let out a scoff noise, knowing how much his life had changed since that day. When he started to drag the bodies of the beast that were turning back to human, even now their bones and muscles twitched as the curse that fueled left the expired bodies. A uh, little help here, he said, tossing the corpses together, looking at the elf who was exhausted. Ah, <sighs> Kai sighed as he forced himself to stand and moved over to the corpses. The bandages on his left arm began to glow violent red as he raised out an outstretched arm towards the bodies. Black flames leapt forward while there seemed to be a wailing that echoed through the forest. Everything, including the blood smeared on the ground, dissolved into flames that erupted violently into the air. And there was no sign left that a battle or even a fight had even been there. Ah, it's so convenient when you are around, Kai. Eh, sometimes I think that's the only reason you like having me around. Anyways, thank you, Shirax. I wouldn't have known he was here if you, if you hadn't have guided me. But the deer was already gone, so you realize the forest goddess had already left. And looking to Van, Kai watched as he sat up against the tree near the now pale girl sleeping. He tossed a satchel towards him as Kai caught hold of it. Inside were provisions of dried meat and biscuits. Uh, thanks, Kai said and looked at the girl. Uh, what will we do about her? And Vanessa was covered in sweat and she was going to have a rough night. She rocked back and forth, muttering under her breath. Please, please save her. Looking at Kai, the elf merely nodded. He already knew that the Black Knight was already thinking. And Kai let out a sigh and looked at the moon. You know he probably has a hand in this matter. You think it's one of the Forsaken Generals, don't you? When isn't it? Besides, this is the best lead we've had in a very long time. Also, it's not like he wants it to get out who I am, anyways. And Kai smirked and took a bite from one of the biscuits, looking at Van. Well, I already know what the plan is. Might as well go along with you. Someone's got to watch your back. The Black Dragon's Knight Chapter 3 Army of Ants Let's get straight into that. The small unit had left the city of Rizak with marching orders to deal with the beast problem in the small town of Wolfgar in the southern woods. The town Wolfgar had been a rest spot for the traders that delivered goods from the southern border to the northern towns. Adventurers had made their way to the town to deal with the problem, but none had returned. The beasts were too clever, striking down most who entered its domain, never leaving survivors when it struck. Only the bloody mess left behind in its wake. Lord Rezok, a fat, stubbornly noble who was full of himself, had decided that a simple beast was easy to deal with. This was a chance to grab glory, since he had none during the war. It was beneath him, he thought, and we were stationed closer to the newly crowned king, protecting him, of course. This was a way to pay for that honour, he thought, that he himself would lead the charge. But twenty men was all he brought since. This was just a mere beast. Among those he brought was a seasoned veteran named Oaken, a sergeant in arms who had served on the front lines during the war. One of the few survivors from the Veldum Massacre and a seasoned warrior. The old man wielded a double-headed broad axe and was still massive despite his age. Some swore that the blood of the giant was in the veins as he stood seven foot, towering over most of the men. His muscles seemed to have been sculpted from stone, and he was not the easiest to handle. The bald man argued forgetting he was low-born and had no right to speak out of turn. However, having the brute along might just put him in his place, show him who really was in charge. However, to shut up Oaken, he did hire a scout and a hunter, 
like he had suggested, for that he let Oaken handle it, as he seemed to know what he was doing. Now Oaken had gone to the Hunter's Guild, but was not part of the adventurers, as they normally let people out to the military. Proper order and the ability to follow commands when given, but Oaken already knew there was someone he had heard of. And that is why the half-orc, Shirea, was with them now. She wore deer-hide clothing, the shirt was sleeveless, falling short at her navel, while she wore breeches held up by a thick belt, and there was a long cloth that ran down the center of the pants. Her boots came out to her knees, concealing the dagger hidden on it. Her quiver was full, hanging off from her left hip, while the other side had a sharp hand axe hanging off from it. A tightly woven cord was strapped around her right arm, and she had a dark green bandana across her forehead. And she didn't wear much jewellery, except for two feather earrings she had earned from ranking up within the Hunter's Guild, and the tusk of the first creature she had hunted down, her so-called father. Now her green skin wasn't the only thing she inherited from him. She had small tusks that slightly came out from the corners of her lower mouth, and was naturally strong. However, she was lucky she had her mum's green eyes, and that she was also known as the Hound, and Oaken had requested her specifically. She was surprised, and so was the guild leader, stating, You know that she has a reputation for dealing with the nobles. I heard the last one she punched in the face. Aye, right, and it interesting. That a girl like that stubborn exists. She would have been loved by the young lord if he were still around. No, she's the May Westerner. Feels she would have been most valuable on this so-called hunt. The chuffing beast is clever and has done enough damage to warrant that we should take the May West we can. An oaken smirk, rubbing a long braided moustache and rubbed the top of his bald head that was tattooed with his tribe symbols. With that, she had been hired on with the caravan that had headed out, and she rode alongside of Oaken for the most part since. She saw that the way the Lord looked at her. She knew the whispers being called Tuskface or worse. The men mostly avoided her, like most locals who didn't care for interspecies relationships. But Oaken, well, he seemed different. You seem different from your lord over there, Sergeant. Ah, just call me Oaken, love. And this ain't a man I wish to serve, but I'll go where I'm ordered to. I served another man during the war. He was more like a brother. Right, didn't care where you came from, as long as you fought and wanted to defend the blokes. Oaken said, adjusting his axe on his back. She scanned the forest line, but was a little surprised by what Oaken had said. Oh, a noble says jumping. You actually obeyed him? Well, I find that hard to believe. I heard you fought in the war, and the rumours say you were one of the only survivors of the Valden Massacre. Is there any truth in that? And Oaken chuckled and looked into those green eyes, saying, Of course, right. I suspect you did your research before taking the Uncle Bob. And Lord Varn is just some noble who issued commands. Nah, right. He were there alongside us fighting, taking the bleeding lead in the fight. Ain't no bloke like him, right? Didn't care for his status, just what we were fighting for. The blooming blokes. This so-called lord, oh, he's just in it for the bleeding glory, thinking it's going to be easy. Isn't it interesting that he don't seem to have noticed it, how quiet the forest has gotten as we travel deeper and closer to Wolfgar. The more this feeling of dread comes over us, I can tell you no. See it all over your nanny goat race girl. He wasn't wrong and she knew what he had been talking about. The forest felt wrong. Hell, a lot of places didn't feel right anymore. And she looked towards the men trudging forward with nervous looks covering their faces. And she sighed and said, I'm not sure why this is happening. It isn't as if the animals aren't here. Well, you can see the signs of them, but they're avoiding us. Selina said, well, It's been like that for a while now. I tried to tell the Lord about it the last time we camped, but he wouldn't hear any of it. <laughs> no, kidding, right? He doesn't understand the gravity of the situation. God blimey, Guff. Not to worry, though. And Oaken gave a wink. We got you to watch our backs. We should leave this place. Come back with an army of rangers and seasoned soldiers. Selina said, looking at the forest. The sun will be going down soon. And she knew the light of the moon would provide some lighting to the forest, but... She'd rather not be here. And the forest seemed darker, as if the shadows threatened to leap up and grab you. A chill lingered on the air, and it felt as if something was caught within her throat. Maybe even her heart. Death was here. It covered the entire area like a blanket. It threatened to creep into the very soul 
as the men could feel it also. You could see it so often as they looked from the roads to the woods. The instinct was something one could not beat, ignored, but that was the wrong choice. Oaken didn't seem bothered one bit though, as far as she could tell. Oh, I'm just a bit better at hiding the blooming nerves than the others, love. Right. Oh, I can tell it ain't right here. It smells like a trap. Like we're being allowed into the woods, just so we can be slaughtered. But ain't nothing there like the shadows themselves are going to reach out and grab you. It was then that the Lord Razok rose his hand up and shot up, and he shouted as it echoed through the tree line. We make camp, set off from the side of the road. Set up my tent and get a fire started. You, Hookface and Barbarian, why don't you two make yourselves useful? Go hunt up some deer or something for us. Look yourself, you serving pig, Selina began to say, but Oaken cut her off. Uh, what she's meaning to say, my lord? We ain't seen anything for a long time. It's too late to go in and hunt now. May Wester break out rations. I know it ain't your calibre, Lord, but I'm sure there's some tasty dried-aged beef we can warm up for you. Razak snuffed and spat at the side. Peasants! Fine. Then help the men set up camp. I don't know why I bother to bring the two of you. Ugh. Why did you bring me along then, my lord? I'll be content with just sitting on my backside back in the city. You got these fine strapping young lot with you. If you like, my grace, we can always excuse ourselves back to the city. I mean, we are, after all, useless, right? Anger crossed over his lips in an almost like sneer. You know your place. You gather my provisions now, and I expect dinner within the hour. Selina cursed under her breath as Oaken looked up to the fading sun. There was a red in the clouds, as if it had been smeared with blood. Ugh, gonna be a hell of a night. Now the air seemed unnaturally colder for the season, and even though it wasn't right for the season, the silence was almost unbearable, as Selina had recommended several fires this night. Rezek was against it, but she put several fire bundles near where she was encamped with Oaken. As she had gotten to know the man and couldn't help but not consider him an old man. He was younger than the Lord Rezak, but more seasoned than the other soldiers. Oaken chose to encamp with her instead of spending time with the men. She never asked why, but tonight she had to know why. Do you think I'm going to fall for your muscles and sleep with you? You're wrong. You might as well go back to your boys and come up with some kind of lie to tell them. My boys? Oaken erupted out laughing and wiped a tear from his eyes. Oh, that's rich. I don't know any of the men, and to boot, nor right welcome round them. Me old lord won't fall off fondly, and many noble-blooded soldiers. Can't even look at some bloke like me. Nah, you're more fun to be with, and probably a lot more handy with that bow than they are with them pikes. Hell fire, this lot hasn't even seen a battle, let alone gone on a hunt. Have a look at them, right? They're not watching the bleeding woods either. Huddled around a fire, chasing the bleeding cold away. Nah, the night's fallen. You'd think that some bloke would understand that we've been out in hostile territory this whole time. By the f goddess, I could use a nice frosty mead to settle me right now. As Selina understood what he was talking about, the Lord was taking this whole situation so lightly, without a care in the world. However, she had heard that many adventurers had gone missing. In Wolfgar. The Hulkin warrior was watching her back while relying on her to watch his, and she realised Oaken was scanning the tree lines, even now, and that his axe was actually unstrapped and ready by his side. He extended his hand, warming it near the fire, and said, You'd expect the night sounds by now. And the flames flickered in her eyes as she coughed a bit. <coughs> Sorry, I just thought the whole soldier thing. Anyways, you talk about this lord all the time. What happened to him? Dunno, to be honest. Ogan had a distant look in his face as he looked deep into the fire and let out a sigh. <sighs> we were headed to the to the border town of Veldan. Selina's eyes widened as she heard the rumours of him being a survivor. No one really knew the details of that day, though. Most of the survivors disappeared, retiring to some lone location. They had all refused to talk about it. 
I've heard rumours. So it's true, then? You're a survivor of the Veldam massacre? Aye, right. I was in the thick of it with the blooming commander. It's funny, right? I remember how much we hated being reminded we were a noble, and the blooming other nobles didn't care for it. That's why we've been selected to go, while the bleeding rest of the blooming armies have been sent elsewhere to deal with another skirmish. The town folk, they would have been slaughtered. After all, what's one border town? Well, that's nothing but commoners. But the bloody commander, well, he wouldn't hear any of that nonsense. So why not send the commoner, love? Right? Squire? Hell, this lot hasn't even seen a battle, right? Let alone gone on a hunt. Have a look at them. They're not watching the bleeding woods either. Huddled around the fire, chasing the bloody cold away. Do what, governor? Oakham paused briefly as he looked up into the fading light of the sun, watching the stars slowly peeking out, blotted out overhead by the trees. He shook his head in disgust as he looked back into the fire, throwing another log on. You were all wrong, though. Our commander, well, he had a bad feeling from the get-go. Even the sun hid that day. Dark clouds gathered overhead. The air was still, almost holding its breath right, waiting for something. The town, all the bloody fucking lot of them, and we showed up what seemed too late. Not a single soul was there. Just blood and carnage. Bodies everywhere. Oh, it were true. Horrifying. But we weren't alone. Nah. Them things were still there. Waiting for us. I watched as they tore the other soldiers to pieces. Leaving nothing in their wake. And all of a sudden, blokes were dead. Bodies everywhere. Stacking up as men and ruddy ladies screamed. As soon as it started, it was ended pretty damn quickly, up and over, within a few minutes. When having a look at the town, some geezer had the mockers put on them things. Pretty sure the commander did it himself right. The mad bastard at the cost of his own life. After all was said and done, no one could find him. He can't have a knees up without a Joanna. Hellfire. He couldn't separate the dead afterwards. Body parts were everywhere. Or it were unlike anything I've ever seen before. And after that, though, the bleeding war, we had to come to an end. Oh, Oaken, I am sorry. No one would have blamed you for walking away from the service after that, let alone end up working for that pompous ass. Celine said, looking towards the elaborate purple and maroon large tent that was being set up. Well, I could have, but the commander, he never would have forgiven me walking away. Not when the bloody blokes need protection. Still... Sometimes, right, it's like you think I'm still alive out there, living life, recovering, but leaving all the corruption behind. And Celine looked at the old man and smiled and said, Why do you think that? Oh, we found the commander's sword in the middle of the blooming battlefield, stabbed through the bloody head of one of them things. His twin brother, right, mage on the bleeding council. Oh, I delivered the bleeding sword to him. He didn't seem upset by it. As if he knew something, we all didn't. And before you ask, the things were large, full of scales, like a lizard man, but something more massive. Twisted horns on their loaf of bread, like a crown upon their head. Uh, lizard men are common. Granted, I've, I've never run into any tribe that had horns like that before. Aye, but they weren't lizard men, more dragon men of hell fire. Two of them, standing like giants clad in armour and skulls of their victims' jewellery and belts. It were as if they were leaking acid from their north and south's right, and smelling of sulphur. Oaken had a horrified look in his eyes as he remembered. And Celine couldn't even imagine such carnage. But she was spared of ever being part of the war, and now she is even more glad she had had part of it. She saw how his knuckles were white from clenching his fist, until he took a deep breath in, relaxing his fist. And she didn't know what to say to the old soldier as he let out a sigh replacing it with a smile just as the sun disappeared behind the trees. The shadows slowly overtook the entire area. Oh, it was cold, as if an icy hand spread across them, forcing everyone to draw closer to the flames of the camp fires. The horses on the other hand were being restless, trying to pull themselves free, and they could sense something as they were becoming frightened. And that was when screams echoed through the woods, filling the silence of the forest. 
The screams made everybody jolt as everybody peered into the darkness, trying to find the source as it seemed to come from all around them. And that was when the thunder of screams became a chorus of howls that rang like a crescendo in the woods and fell dead silent again. What the hell was that? Celine asked as she grabbed up her bow, notching an arrow. Ogun held his axe and slid his foot back, readying himself. The men looked afraid, gripping their weapons tightly. Everyone, close rank just in case, Ogun shouted. Belay that order. What do you think you are doing, Ogun? Are you jumping at shadows? You are soldiers of the Empire. Don't be scared of some wolves. S sir that wasn't natural. It sounded like screams. One of the soldiers spoke up. Don't be stupid. The woods play tricks. Fine. Set up a small patrol and bring me my supper. You idiots. He said as Rizak walked back into his tent. Damn fool, Oaken said. Do as he says. Be on guard, everyone. And a patrol consisted of four men who drew the short straw, grabbing up their gear. The sergeant-at-arms, Oaken, told them to actually do a circle around the encampment instead of spreading out. The leader of the group, Alexander, thought that this was stupid, and as soon as they were out of view, he stopped the three. Well, this is dumb. We should split up and get this over with quickly. Put Sergeant, Oaken said we should stick together. Ollie, a younger member, stated, feeling the uneasiness of the silent forest. Oh, shut it, you. Oaken is just an old man. You heard Lord Rezak. It's just some wolves. Dumb beasts, that's all. Jacken said, standing by Alexander. Two man teams. We spread out to the end of the line and back before too long. I mean, if we run into some dogs, we can easily handle them. Right. Jove chuckled, as he was a bit wider in the belly, saying, It'll be easy to deal with, kid. Everyone is just on edge because this is the first time we're going to see some action. Granted, it's just some beast. That's probably what was just making the noise. Hell, we kill this bastard likely to get a raise in pay. Molly just shook his head as he took his helmet off and ran his hands through his red curly locks. The others seemed so confident in what they were saying, but he looked back at the encampment. The Sarge hadn't steered them wrong yet, and he knew he was looking out for them, but there was something out there, something that just put him on edge. Alexander put his hand on his shoulder and said, Don't worry, Joe will go with you. He is the strongest of us, right? He's got your back, and it will take us half the time to patrol. Come on, Ollie. And Jack had nodded his head to the side in approval. Ollie slipped his helmet on and let out a sigh of exasperation. And the boys knew they had persuaded him to go along with the plan. Jove slapped Ollie on the shoulder as he said, That's my boy. Come on, then. You can carry the torch. Ah, to keep you safe. And the three chuckled as Ollie couldn't help but smile with them. The four had decided to walk the lines going in opposite directions of each other, and decided to give a whistle to signal if they came across anything. Alexander and Jacken took the front of the line, just past the Lord's tent, while Ollie and Jove moved towards the back, close to the Sarge. They were about twenty feet out from the encampment, staying on the edge of the fire lines. It wasn't like the Sarge would be paying attention to them anyways. Alexander reasoned, but he was too busy flirting with the tusk face. He didn't even know why she was even here. But they were all trained and could deal with this so-called beast. Alexander shook his head as he walked along and said, Goddess, this was stupid. Why the hell do we have to be out here? I mean, this is stupid. We stay out by the fires and we huddle in waiting for the beast to move in. It's just a dumb animal. You know what I mean, Jacken? Alex turned to the left to see what was going on and realized that Jacken had gone missing. He hadn't even heard the tall lanky man take off. He didn't want to light a torch as it would alert Oaken that they had disobeyed his orders. As two torchlights would give that away. However, he knew Jacken was a practical joker, often pulling stunts for no reason other than to get a rise. Oi, did you step off to take a piss or something, Jacken? You there, mate? Stop fooling around. And he heard something like a muffle of something as if trying not to laugh or burst out screaming. Letting out a sigh, he went towards the tree. Oi, knock it the hell off, man. It's getting cold and I'm getting hungry. Alexander 
went around the tree to the muffled noise and stepped into something wet and mushy. It smelled horrendous and had added a copper taste to the air. Oh, come on, man. I think I just stepped in your ship. If you had to crap that bad, you should have... What the fuck? The soldier uttered the words belly under his breath as his eyes went wide. Jacken, still belly alive, lay with his guts strewn out over the ground and blood spurting from his throat. It had been cut, as he could see the jagged bits of tattered flesh and armor sticking out, even in the dark. Fear gripped him as he scrambled back away from the fallen friend, slipping on what he knew to be innards of his friend. The scream wanted to come out, but it refused, caught in his throat as he scrambled back up and looked at his wet palms. They were covered in blood and mud. He tried to wipe them off desperately, off onto himself, as he scrambled back to his feet and his senses coming back to him. Alexander turned to scream towards the line to warn them, but as he did, his view was blocked. The beast stood well over him, almost as if he were a giant, its glowing red eyes staring down at him. The razor claw came upward swiftly, catching a lower part of the man's jaws. Muscles, teeth, and bones exploded as his tongue flapped in the wind, exposed. Horror filled the young man's eyes as he dropped to his knees, trying to say something, but only a gurgling noise escaped his mouth as his hand reached desperately for the short sword at his side. A blinding light exploded as more pain took over him and he tumbled to the ground, reaching for where his arm had been. The wolf beast had torn it off as if it were nothing, ripping muscle and flesh with ease. The creature held it above its muzzle, letting the torn arm's blood leak into its mouth, all the while staring down at him. As this happened, Ollie couldn't help but keep staring into the tree line as Jove just hummed, picking at his nose. Crack! A twig snapped in the distance, and the young man's hand went for his blade. Jove himself reached for his own blade, staring around at the sudden action of the small man. What? What is it? I heard something. A branch cracked out there. He said, drawing the blade straight off his hip. And Jove shook his head, and let out an exasperated sigh. At Ollie, while shaking his head. Ollie could feel it, though. Something wasn't right. And as he started to slowly back towards the tree line, trying to escape the darkness while holding the torch high in his other hand. Ah, you worry over nothing, me old boy. It's just the wildlife. I mean, hell, torch will probably keep him back. Ollie shifted again, crouching as he could see something from the reflection of the light. The hair on the back of his neck stood up, and he said, Would you shut up? Something's out there, Jove. We gotta get Sarge out here, man. Look, I walk out there and show you that there's nothing to be afraid of. Won't take me but a second. Ah, you always get this way. Want everyone to think you're a coward, man. Coward? <laughs> that was a funny word, he thought, wanting to save one's own skin and not seek out trouble where he could. Yeah, since he had been little, he could sense danger was about him. His father may have been a noble, but they were still poor, and a man liked his drink. Wouldn't be such a problem if he hadn't taken it out on his mother and him. Now, Ollie had gained a sixth sense about these things, and knew when to hide from the drinker. Well, he was small, and his father was very large. As soon as he was able to, he had left to join the army, hoping to make something of himself, hoping that he could get strong enough to beat back men like his father. But the dream had slowly proved to be something of a lie. The soldiers, or they were greedy, loud mouths and lazy to boot. None of them really trained hard or wanted to improve themselves, and it had all changed when Sergeant Oaken arrived, as he was something entirely different. But sure, the Lord hated him, and most looked down on him for not being a noble, but the man was made of different stock. Oaken had tried to train the men, with only a few actually listening to learn, and he had been told that there actually wasn't anything wrong with him to listen to those instincts when it came down to it. Looking at Jove, he shook his head and said, Oh, come on. Uh, let's get the sergeant. Damn be the consequences. Oh, when are you going to listen to me? The old man doesn't know anything. What the hell is wrong with you? He watched as the young man's eyes widened in horror. Then he felt the sharp claws dig into his back. Ollie watched as the beast rose from the shadows as if it was part of the shadows. It looked to be a massive black wolf, but its body was that of a man, 
covered in long, thick, coarse hair. It stood on its haunches, but the front paws weren't paws at all. No, they were long, lanky arms that ended in massive clawed hands. Each was like a black dagger at the end of each finger. The snout was full of long, razor-sharp fangs that were pulled back with red and the black gums in the torchlight. And Jove grunted out in painful horror as his hand reached towards the sword on his side. Run, Ollie! Before he could even draw the blade, he was lifted off the ground, and the rip of muscle could be heard. The claw sliced through, grabbing hold of the spine itself, before ripping it free from Jove's body, instantly killing him. Terror ripped through young Ollie as he saw the forest light up with several pairs of red eyes. The beast was not alone. The men set off into the woods, while others started to prepare meals. It was simple campfire stews, as they would throw bits of vegetables and dried meat in. Some old bread was used to sop up the juices and fill their bellies. However, Lord Rezak had a pheasant cooking over the fire, and with fresh biscuits being made. The Lord didn't know what it meant to survive, and didn't care that his men ate like a dog. And for Oaken, he kept jerky ready and biscuits for such an occasion. He handed some jerky to Selene, and tore into one, scanning a forest line. The silence ate away at Selene as she gathered up her equipment, but Oaken put a hand on her shoulder, shaking his head. I should be out there, with a patrol. I'd rather you be by my side for now. Besides, I have a bad feeling about the blooming situation. He tightened his grip on his axe as his eyes scanned across the forest. And she let out a sigh and took a bite out from the jerky, and then let out another sigh. She kept her bow handy, ready to attack if necessary. However... The rest of the troops seemed so relaxed and they had almost forgotten about what had happened when the sun went down. They were already laughing and forgetting what they'd all heard just a short time ago. And some of the men seemed nervous, staying close to their weapons and following the patrol that was walking the perimeter. But the fact that most of them were so carefree, I really pissed her off. And she let out a sigh of frustration and scanned the tree lines again. Nobles, don't they know that something is wrong with this place? closer we get to that town, it just, just pisses me off. Well, that's not their fault. Most of them are born with no claim to their house. Either this or join the clergy. It's how the nobles work. That's why they start off so low. Most high-ranking house members cop the rank of commander or an higher position. They said it was easy till I showed up. Some of them took to it, but most of them don't even respect me. That doesn't bother you? Oaken nodded and chuckled. <laughs> of course it does. But in it the bleeding damnedest thing. I die protecting these lads. Don't get me wrong. Well, it's nothing to do with their titles or status. They are citizens and that's what my commander cared about. These fellas are just stupid is all. Done out her ass from their heads. Now before she could say anything anymore, her head snapped to the other end as the wind blew on by and there was a copper smell to it. It was blood. A lot blood. Something has happened. Then the torch that was close to them was running towards them. More blood flowed on the air as she snapped towards the torchlight, rushing towards them. The horses, they started to buck and go wild, drawing the attention of everyone. They damn near ripped their own heads off, trying to break free. And Selene and Oaken looked back to the black forest, seeing who was approaching them. It was the smallest soldier, one of the four that had been with the patrol. And as he approached, unearthly howls rang out through the forest, followed by several more from different directions. The pitch was so loud it forced everyone to grab a hold of their ears in pain, including Selene. Ogun had already taken off as he grabbed a hold of the soldier. Ollie, what's got on in you? Why are you running like the devil's on your back, boy? Sarge, he is dead. Monsters. Wolves. They tore him apart. We split up. Oh, goddess. The others went that way. Jove, Sarge, Jove. He ripped out his fucking spine. And there were more. There's fucking more out there. And just as he said that, before Oaken could shout for the others to take arms, the large black wolf started out of the woods with incredible speed. One of the soldiers seemed to explode into a pool of blood, as another was grabbed and dragged off into the woods with ease. 
Screams erupted as the men tried to scramble as claws ripped into them. Selim was already notching several arrows, firing them directly right before them. The bowstring strung to life as several arrows thudded into the chest of one of the wolves that had charged at them. It sent it falling back, but as it tumbled, it let out a low rumble that sounded almost like laughter. When it was already rising and ripping the arrows from its chest as if it were nothing. Screw you! Selene shouted as she launched another arrow, as it slammed true into its eye and out the back of its head. It let out a howl of pain, but Oko moved forward, drawing his axe back, and as he did, the head lit up as Ryton appeared along the edge. The axe head bit deep as he brought it upwards with a mighty roar, slicing straight through the muzzle of the beast. Black Ica exploded over the ground and there was a surprised look within those red eyes as they vanished. Ever since that day, I swore I would never be helpless. Come on, you fucks, come cop some. Oaken growled up, issuing a challenge to the beast. Selene noted the bodies of many other soldiers and blood spattered everywhere. The young soldier Ollie seemed stunned and gripped by fear as she notched the bow again, and then several of the beasts moved, rushing at them. As Oaken pulled a dagger out, tossing it to her, I had the same runes as the axe head, and he said, Protect the boy. We need to run, you idiot. Celine caught the dagger and instantly notched her bow, taking aim at those approaching. But something was different about these ones. She pulled out, and there was a click following as she notched them. She fired, and they struck one beast. A large blast of flame erupted, turning a big furball into a ball of writhing flames. She had managed to hit two more, but five more were already headed their way, along with two as they were rushing towards Oakham. And the warrior was ready and couldn't help but whistle. <whistles> now that was amazing. How many of them you got? And shaking her head. I prepared a lot, but I've only got two left on me. The rest are in the supply wagon. Uh, can you hold out? What choice do we have? Oakham growled out and drew up his axe as the two wolves started to charge at him. And as he braced himself, he could hear something else. It drew the attention of even the beasts as they turned their heads in a direction behind the three. It was the sound of the beating hooves rushing towards them. And from the darkness, a small hand axe flew out of nowhere, smashing into the head of the wolf on the left. Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is an exclusive story from a brand new author by the name of KB Michaels. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside... Let's get into tonight's story and title. The Black Dragon's Night. Death rides in the night. Let's get straight into that. Rezak sat on his cot and had his manservant pull the armor off from his body and place it onto the table, laid out neatly. The man poured him his wine as he grumbled. Codess knows I need a bath. I should have just sent these fools without me. I need not to be here to claim the glory. I don't know why his highness ordered me to accompany these men. It's beneath me. Yes, my lord. Tis but a summon of your status to be on a glorified hunt. The servant agreed, eager to please his lord. He set off to his other tasks as the men, who were there as personal guards to Rezak, had started to cook his supper. That man, that peasant, and his hooked-faced girl, stirring up trouble for no good reasons. Just a pack of wolves sniffing around for scraps. Bah! If I could rid them, I would have. But they may prove useful, yet. Maybe as a reward, I'll have that oaf sent out to work the mines, in the mountains with the dwarves and the other lusses. Rezak complained as normal. 
He tries to act as if he is better somehow. Such a low-born thinking, he can be compared to a great noble blood running within my veins. I'd tell the minds with that one, my lord, along with a hook-faced girl, so openly defiant, his servant said as he began to polish the armour. Reza gave a smug smile and sipped on his wine, as his mouth watered for something good to eat. How he missed the elaborate meals back home and would kill for just one kidney pie. He hated the cold and hated that he was even out in the forest. He stood and moved to the lantern, hanging in the tent, staring up into its golden rays. Ah, yes, this was all beneath him. He was a lord of a town after all, and just because some adventurers couldn't handle the task he was here. Rezak thought how he would show the small town of peasants, the benevolence of the nobles. Maybe he could even make it part of his own territory, expanding his own control and powers, and breaking in the benefits of taxes from them. And as he admired that plan, he was torn from his thoughts as chaos erupted all around him from outside. Howls erupted from what sounded like it was coming from everywhere. Razak dropped his wine as he reached for his ears, covering his head, trying to drown out the howls as he dropped to his knees. And as he opened his eyes, he could see the men were screaming and scrambling for what he could see through the tent flap. What in the hell is going on out there? Gerald, go look to see what is happening. However, the little man servant said nothing and didn't even move. I said go look what's happening, you sniveling little wart. Rezak whipped around to see blood splashed across his armor and with the body laid over it. One hand was out, reaching for his lord. His blood pumped from his throat and a tall black wolf creature stepped out, revealing its razor-sharp teeth. Its long tongue licked the blood from the fingers as it approached him. Fear took a hold of him and piss ran down his legs. He turned to run, but the beast was already tackling him to the ground. Its rancid breath smelled of putrid bile and rotted meat. Rezak couldn't help but feel tears well up in his eyes as he started to beg and plead to what god or goddess would hear him to save him. And it was then that, rather than a growl, the words seemed to emerge in guttural, gravelly voice. Lord Rezak, I presume. Yes, I, I, I am Lord Rezak. What do you want from me? The fat little man managed to get out between his snot-filled face and sobs. Good. I am your escort. My lord has been expecting you. The creature sneered out. Don't worry. You are not going to die tonight. A mighty black warhorse came out from the shadows. It was dressed in a black metal barden and with horns coming from the chaffron, making it look like some kind of nightmare. And it was some kind of silver lining along the edges of the pieces of plates, along with engraved swirls of patterns and ruins upon them. The rider seemed to match the same as the horse's armour. The man had long red hair that came out the back from his open face, ornate helmet. The helmet came to a point over his face, with spikes that could be mistaken for four black metal horns, pointing towards the back of it. His face was hidden behind shadows and a red tattered scarf beneath the armour. The rest of his black full plate armour resembled such a pattern. The black pauldrons had two spikes on each one, connected to the black breastplate and gorget. The placard was a sturdy black leather, looking as if it was tight to his body, and with three silver ridges along either side of his stomach. The fold was connected to a thick belt with black red chaps that seemed torn at the ends. They covered the black spike pauline and greaves. Even the gauntlets were talent at the fingertips, and with spikes coming out the backs of the counter. Like Sleepner's bar in set, it also had intricate silver lines running along the tips and edges, and with intricate etchings on them. He moved with ease as he slipped off the side of the horse, pulling free the massive sword on its side. Sleep near, protect them, as the massive horse put itself between the beasts and two closest to the fire. Selene felt as if she was staring at some kind of demon, shocked that help had even arrived, and despite holding a massive sword, he pulled the black blade back as the creatures came rushing at him, and his eyes seemed to glow with a green hue from the shadows of his helmet. As he swung, he let out a grunt and smashed the blade into several of the creatures, cutting through bone and tissue. Selim was about to shout out as he was open, when she heard the faintest click noise and a thinner straight blade came swinging out catching one of the beasts, looking to take advantage of the massive swing, and was thus struck into the ground. The man shouted behind him, Shield! 
Selene saw the kite shield resting on the side of the mighty warhorse. It was like the rest of his armour, black with a silver lining running along it, leading to a large red gem. She grabbed a hold of it and noticed that it seemed lighter than a normal shield, but shouted, Here! as she tossed it his way, not sure how he would even be able to catch it. It landed with a thud, gem side down, and then she was surprised at how he moved with ease. The knight first avoided being caught by one of the last two beast's claws, by rolling back and effortlessly grabbed up the shield in the same process. As he came up, the second Romanian beast was already coming down, and with hands extended and mouth wide open, saliva and drool dripping from its maw. The knight put his shoulder behind the shield, coming up in an upward motion and slamming it directly into the snout with a bone-crunching sound. And not wasting the momentum, the black knight swung out, forcing the beast to the side. He charged forward as the other was scrambling towards him. The long double-edged blade moved faster, catching between the shoulder and neck of the beast, biting deep, spreading black ichor everywhere. The other was shaking his head as the knight spun, bearing the black blade backwards and splitting its raised hand and face in two. Oaken didn't hesitate either, as he charged the one that had run towards him still. The beast swung its mighty claw, but was surprised by the agile movements of the mammoth of man. The claw met with only air, and felt the massive boot come up, striking its snout. The power alone sent the beast tumbling back as it let out a whimper, rolling through the dirt. The beast started to get up, but was met with the head of the glowing axe, slicing deep through its skull. Its black ichor splashed everywhere, and he managed to kick the lifeless corpse from his axe. Oaken then turned his attention to the one that had an axe in its head, half expecting for it to be standing, but as he did, he could hear pops and cracks as his body became that of a naked man. Merciful goddess, what the high hells is that? A man turning into a beast? He saw the black knight standing and scanning the area, making his way slowly towards the other fire encampments, shielded already, the black blade gleaming in the light. It's not done yet. Be on guard. Protect those two. The voice stirred something in Oaken as he instinctively and slowly backed up towards Selene. He couldn't help but comply as he shouted back, Who the hell are you? Where the hell did you come from? No, oh, hell spells. Why are you going to be bothering asking something like that right now? I'm obviously helping you at the moment. And that's what matters right now. Unless you want to lose your balls to a pack of mongrels, then far be it for me to stop a thunderhead as yourself. The knight said, carefully stepping over one of the dead bodies and scanning the tree line. What'd you just say? Gypsy now. Only one gazer I know of uses that bloody language. But it can't be. Nah, no way in Gypsy now. He would just show up of all the godforsaken situations. As Selene looked at Oaken and said, Who do you think it is? Commander Vaughn, is that you? Oaken asked, almost dropping the axe. Oh, it's you. Where the hell have you been, you lousy, no good, rotten bastard? Uh, I can explain, but right now, we can figure all that shit out later. After we survive the night. Hell, spouse, that's if we survive the night. Vaughn said, still watching the woods blade ready, as he could see more trouble was on its way. Vaughn could see them clearly despite the darkness as the power flowed through his veins and there were four hanging back watching them, waiting for them to drop their guards. The other three moved towards him as Oaken said, What do you mean in over? I mean bloody hell. How many more bastards can there be? Right here? Four at least. Vaughn said, nodding towards them. Selene rushed over to the supply wagon and pulled the chest she had prepared out. She had made this particular flint arrows just in case. She had heard the rumours and wanted to be prepared for anything, just to be on the safe side. She popped the lid open and placed several within the quiver, still keeping an eye on the back side. Vaughn looked down at the arrows and said, Well, I've never seen arrows like those before. Make a loud bang. Light things on fire. What can I tell? Oaken said. The two broke away, moving around and trying to outflank them. And Ollie finally said, They're all dead. Every last one of them are dead. How the hell are we going to survive? By getting off your ass and fighting. But Vaughn could see the sheer terror had taken the young man. Well, in your case, stay by. Sleep near. He'll protect you. As if the mighty black warhorse understood, he snotted and trotted closer to them. 
These four were being cautious, waiting for the right moment. The massive blade was still on the ground, but Varn knew it would be harder, and with everyone around him, he had to use the double-bladed longsword in the moment. How were you able to kill them with that blade? Is it enchanted, like Oaken's axe? That's a longer explanation for another time. All you need to know is... But Selene cut him off. This so-called Commander Varn, right? Surprised that someone with noble blood can fight as well as you are? Oh, I see Oaken still talking about me. You know me, but who are you? Selene, the Huntress, and I work for the Hunter's Guild. That man hired me to help kill the beast that has been terrorizing the town of Wolfgar. My regrets ever coming, though. She growled out as a snap came to her left, and she notched the arrow, waiting. Commander, she's good at what she does. Worth the price. Oaken added as he crouched, sensing something was coming. Varn had heard of her and knew of her reputation. Well, I never thought I would get to meet someone so famous. Let's see if you live up to the rumors, shall we? The word triggered something she had heard. Rumors that were floating around about a particular knight clad in black. The world seemed to have more monsters appearing, as more adventurers took the calling, but there had been a rumor of a black knight, killing the creatures in his wake. Mere table talk from drunkards, but now she wondered if they were true. Before she could even ask, the beasts attacked from the four different directions. She flicked the wick and brought the bow up, firing it true. She managed to stick the arrow into the gaped jaws as it exploded and engulfed the beast in flames. She twisted, grabbing hold of another, and let the bowstring go with a thrum that echoed like a cord. The arrow exploded and engulfed the beast in a huge ball of fire, making it drop to the ground and trying to roll and put the flames out. Oaken and Varn had already kicked forward towards the beast charging at them. The big man's axe spun around, driving down into the shoulder and biting deep down and severing it from the joint. The beast was stunned as it was then faced with a massive fist, punching it square in the nose and with equal force. The giant of a man didn't wait as he followed with an upward arc, catching it square in the chest and breaking through rib bones and the sternum into its black heart. Varn caught his own with his shield. The claw skidded down the plate, causing sparks, and Varn grunted and pushed his claw hand back and followed by bringing up the blade and slicing deep into its side. Let out a painful scream, slash how, as it stumbled back. It turned to try and run away, but Varn brought the shield down, striking its hind quarter and driving a point into it. The beast collapsed and tried to pull itself to the tree line, but Varn stood up and stepped down on its back. It raised the sword with both hands and drove the point down, ripping through its neck and giving it a twist. The head popped off and rolled back out into the darkness. It then scanned and saw no more of the beasts were around them. Black and crimson blood covered the ground as he could smell burning fur, turned to burnt flesh very quickly. He let out a sigh and turned to face the other three. And as he did, a massive fist struck him in the face. Chapter 5 Orders Let's get straight into that. The one Lucius carried had passed out right away. He was a coward and he was pretty sure that the fat man pissed himself. He'd rather cut the bastard open, eat his noble guts and leave the rest for some vulture to eat what was left of the corpse. But he had his orders. Master Halligan had told him he was to bring the fat little lord to be given the gift. It was to serve the greater goal, to start expanding the territory to other parts of the land. And if he could do so, Lucius would slaughter thousands and bring their hearts to his master. He would not get to take part in a feast of the young flesh of the noble little soldiers, but he will be rewarded. He was one of the trusted of his master, and in so was given tasks that others could not follow. When Lucius would bark, the others obeyed. They were always drunk off their own power, forgetting who they served and how their lives had changed. He had told the others that remained to make short work, not to spend too much time gorging on the remaining men. And the big fellow had smelled weird though, and he had put his heckles on edge along with the red-headed half-orc. They had been watching the woodline, not lounging about like the others. They were aware something wasn't right about them, as if they knew they had approached. They should have captured him and brought him to the master. They had good instincts and they weren't appreciated as they were towards the back of the encampment. 
oh well, their hearts would serve the master one way or another. And as he moved with ease, despite carrying the large man, two others followed behind him. They were staring at the Lord, licking their long tongues across their muscles. He snapped at the two with a snarl. Are you daft? He is for the Master Halligan, or would you risk his wrath? Just a hand? Surely he wouldn't. But the other was cut off as Lucius's claw flung out and slammed into the maw of the speaking wolf. He fell with a whimper, crying out in pain. The other shrunk out of fear as the blazing eyes stared down at them. Do you wish to challenge me, boy? The wolf on the ground shook his head and mumbled. No, Lucius, forgive me. The hunger sometimes gets ahead of me. Remember your places. We serve Master Halligan. What is taking those idiots so long? Lucius growled out, realizing they should have already been joined by the others in the hunting party. It shouldn't have taken them long to deal with the remaining soldiers. He sniffed the air, but unfortunately was upwind of the attack. Roll! Go find out what has taken them so long. We are headed back to the village. Yes, it was a three-day journey back for normal people, for where they had been located. But the truth was that powerful bodies they had had been gifted, and made short work of that in the span of a day at most. They would travel at the speed of the moon, Taking the fat man would slow them down a bit, but luckily they had a plan for that. Rope and a gag had been prepared for the fat little man. He could only hope that the fat little lord would be a brave one and refused, having a little of a spike, but he knew better. In the face of a mighty man like Halligan, the fat little lord would see the wisdom in his master's offer, and knew that fear would also help him in that choice. And Roll nodded as he took back off in the dark seemed perfectly clear as if it was a sunny day. The other, Badger, stood up letting out a snuffle and asked, Should I go with him? I should, just so you could run off that extra energy of yours. Lucius said with a sneering across his face, but looked ahead of him. No, we have to hurry before the moon goes down. We have much ground to cover. Besides... I am sure that Ro can manage to get the others to come as commanded. And Ro wasted no time as he knew Badger was always eager to hunt. Ro knew that it angered the young wolf, but he would have his time soon enough. He was older and level-headed compared to the other two, so when Halligan told him to go along, he knew why. He didn't serve out of fear or sniveling at the backside of Halligan. No, he did it to survive to be strong and never be under the hill of someone again. Now, all had worked out except the last part. He had to serve the master. It wasn't a bad life, but he always was looking for a way to escape. To escape with his power, but he knew the bastard could easily call him back to his side with just a thought. Nor with the exception of a handful of villagers gave in. Those who hadn't should have been cut down and made into a feast for the Red Moon but Halligan provided them with protection. Halligan had assured them that one day soon they would deal with them, and those who hadn't turned kept their mouths shut and locked themselves up tight to avoid the night. Oh, he did enjoy scratching on the doors, hearing them whimper as he did. Oh, what fun he had now that his body was repaired and that he could take out his vengeance. No, justice for all the ridicule he had suffered. It didn't take long for him to get back to the encampment. The blood was thick in the air. They hadn't wasted any time to slaughter the soldiers. However, he couldn't hear anything. Not the snapping of bones, not the feasting of flesh. It was odd, as he heard the crackling of the fire by the various fires that had been set up. The others would have already doused the flames, the like could still mess with their eyes. Even now, he was switching to his other senses, trying to pick up on their body heat. It was a nifty trick, but not many of the others could do such a thing. The fire made it harder to tell, but luckily he knew that they burned hotter than a normal human. They weren't though, but he could smell them still. It made no sense, as they were everywhere in this forest, but he knew the older sense from the others. He slowly crept from the shadows, moving in closer, 
his ears perking up as he scanned the area for noise. Something was here, but they had all been well hidden. He wasn't sure if they were in the woods or if it was coming from the encampment, and so he crept closer, keeping low and cautious about the whole situation now, and there was more blood than normal, as he could smell something else. He had captured the scent of everyone who had been here before, but something or something had changed. There was someone else that had arrived and on it with the scent that sent a chill down his spine. It was something that wasn't right. The stranger was something entirely he had never smelt before, and his instincts told him to run. Now, he couldn't disobey, though, as he had to find out what had happened to the hunting pack before he took off. And as he approached closer, the fires that were burning were much larger than the original fires that were burning. There were also several other new fires, also throughout the forest. And fear gripped him as he recognized what was burning. It was the corpses of the hunting pack mixed with the soldiers' bodies. Somehow, they had been restored back to their human form, but more importantly, they had been cut down. The black blood forced the flame to burn hotter. Normally, moving out of the shadows wasn't a problem, but something had managed to eliminate not just one of them, but the entire pack. And as he was about to turn back and run, a tree exploded near him. He barely avoided a massive blade taking out a giant chunk of the tree that exploded near him. And out from the black was that strange scent that made every inch of his fur stand up on end. The flames of the light caused the black armor to shimmer within the dark, and all he could think of was the absurdity of how massive the curved blade coming at him was. The sheer fact the stranger was already whipping it back around was madness. He tried to leap back before the sting of the axe catching him in the shoulder and dropping him to the ground. The strike was fast and hard as he let out a mournful howl of pain while whimpering. He had been so careful. He couldn't die here, not now. Despite the pain, he pushed upwards, using his massive strength to his advantage, trying to push whoever was on top of him off. Instead, a massive foot collided with his back and slamming him to the ground. It had to be the large one at the end with the axe. He dropped the blade to the side of his snout and he could see the runes etched on the head were glowing. Roll's large eyes opened wide with fear as he tried to scramble away from the underfoot. Stop! I don't want you to die! He cried out. I've done everything to survive now. That's all! I don't want to kill! <coughs> I just want to live! Oi! These things talk! I... I can tell you where they are. How to find the beast. I beg you! Roll shouted as his body shrunk and his form turned more human. Bone cracked as his face shrank and his body twisted back to a naked man. Well, I'll be damned. Isn't it the strangest thing? He's so small and naked. Have pity on me. I'm just a frail man. A weak man. Roll knew that they would look upon his frail form and be like others who looked down on him. They would let down their guard and then he would run. His wound was not healing though, as blood was still coming up. The black mess that had replaced his blood. And Roll could see the grey stormy eyes looking down at him with pity, while the half-orc girl came forward also. Just... Who the hell are you? I am a villager from Wolfgar. We all are. Cursed is the best way to put it. Rose said, groveling. We had no choice. We either followed Master Halligan or met at death. What choice did we have? But I can see now, brave warriors, that with you here, we can save the village. The giant axe warrior looked at the armored warrior and said, we can help these. You lying son of a codpiece. Every word you're saying is full of crap. I don't know what you're talking about. I never wanted to hurt a soul. I promise you that. I had no choice in the matter. We had to follow him or meet a horrible end. Roll shouted. You wouldn't understand what it means to. The girls are alive. Your little buddies are dead. Rage took over Roll as he knew what that meant. He let out a roar and jumped at the armoured figure, while he began to transform back to his beast. The older axe warrior 
and Girl were caught by surprise as the claw hand extended as his body twisted itself. The armored figure's eyes seemed to glow a green beneath the shadows of the helm, and a ridiculous massive curved sword came down fast and hard. The weight of the shear blade forced its way through the body, as the sharp blade had no problem cutting through tissue, muscles, and bone while driving the body into the ground. Roll could only think as he felt his soul being dragged into the dark. How the hell had this happened? Who the hell was this man that came like a dark spirit of vengeance? Even as the darkness overtook him, he could swear he saw a female, with horns coming from the sides of her head and had long black hair, and was standing by the man. Her deep purple eyes stared at him, and with a wicked grin growing over her face, your master's time has come. Chapter 6 Forward, not back. Let's get straight into that. Var let out his breath, and he loosened his grip, his eyes scanning the forest around them. The beast thing now lay split down the centre, as its black blood pulled out and the body returned back to its human form. The others stared, still stunned by what they were watching, while Van felt at ease finally. He was walking away back to the road of the dead encampment, and ripped apart of the velvet-style tent to wipe the massive blade clean. He rested it against the wagon before grabbing up a torch. How the hell did you know that that, that thing was coming? Celine broke out from her fear. And how are you so damn calm? Ollie came out from the other side, leading the mighty black warhorse towards Van and looking at the fire, and said nothing. Van ignored the huntress as he moved to the corpse on the ground, but was stopped by the large warrior again, who reached out to grab him. Oaken stopped as he saw those eyes truly were different, and something screamed danger. Oaken stepped to the side, not sure what was stopping him this time. I'm feeling you, Osimarsis, Commander. Oaken mustered up finally as he watched Van light the corpse on fire. Fair enough, Oaken. These things aren't human anymore, and made a deal with the Ark Demon. About a month ago, I ran into a girl, running from these things, and we managed to get help for her, but we already killed a set of them. I made my way down here to put an end to the Ark Demon General. I just happened to be close by when I heard the attack. I'm sorry that I couldn't get here sooner. Then maybe they all wouldn't be dead. Ark Demon? You talking about the rumor of the thirteen black generals? It's just a rumor. It's not real. There's no such beings. Selene said, shaking her head. What are you babbling about, Selene? Oaken asked, raising an eyebrow. He hadn't heard anything about this before, and he spent a lot of time at the tavern and bars when not on duty. I never heard anything about this before. You wouldn't. Most adventurers and guild members dismiss these things as Overzealous people who have lost their nerves. Isn't that right, Miss Huntress? You still haven't told us how you knew it was coming. You brought that strange sword and killed them with ease. You fight like a... A demon? Yeah, I get that a lot. Say it's a blessing and a curse. I can feel those things and I can see in the dark, thanks to my circumstances. It's my job to put these bastards in the ground. Each of those generals and the man who brought them forth. Van said, making his way back to the roadside. He patted the horse and pulled the helmet from his head, letting his long red mane free. Hey kid, can you help me get my armor off? Just unclasp the sides. I can do the rest. Aren't you afraid that they might come back? Ollie said as the other two followed him back to the fire. Is it wise to... Take it so ham and cheesy. All he has got a point. Knows my hammer and tack and finish what they started. Ain't you afraid? Oaken asked, shaking his head and scanning around. No, it's moving away. More than likely going back to their den. Not sure how far, but I'm sure they'll figure out eventually that a little back isn't coming back. Anyways, what are you all going to do? Van asked as Ollie finally helped him to remove the breastplate. There are more of those things. Well, the Lord is either dead or run off into the night. I don't think I'm going to get my pay. I plan to 
get me one of those horses and get in the high hell out of here. No offense, but I think it's best we all hit the trail and bring an army back with us, Celine said, scanning through the forest line herself. Or just forget the whole damn accursed place altogether. I agree with her, Sarge. We need to get the hell out of here. Report about how the Lord was lost, Ollie added as he watched Varn sit down and start to recook the bird that had been cooking earlier. You're a sergeant now? Well, I see you've made your way up the ranks since we last saw each other. Congrats. I couldn't think of a better man to be promoted. And Oaken shook his head and made his way to the tent, looking inside. The snivelling servant that served Lord Rezak was in a bloody mess on his armour, but there was no body within. No signs of struggle or panic to escape it. However, he could smell the piss still on the ground as he spit to the side, looking back at the other three. He ain't dead, but he pissed himself, ain't it? Besides, they end up hanging us for abandoning the wee fat man out here. He effing ran, which I doubt, or they probably took him with them. But why? Who would want that fat, cowardly man? Celine said, shaking her head while placing her fingers to her head. Let me guess, Sarge. You want me to track him down? No need for that. Probably took him to Wolfgar. I mean, that's who these people are. Not all of them are infected, but a good portion of the town accepted this so-called gift. He's probably going to be offered the same deal. And since he is a coward, like you say, he will jump at the chance. Varn said, while rotating the chicken. What? Why would you think that? You were all sent out here to die, more than likely. No, he was the target all along. He comes back as a hero able to spread the Ark Demon's influence. This was the man's plan all along. Farn said as if it were a fat. Commander, we were sent here by a king's order. He wouldn't have anything to do with this. He wants to peace return to this trade route. You're accusing the fucking crown of some high-level corruption there. Could cop you killed if you don't mind your tongue. Oaken said as he tightened the grip on the axe handle. While he stood stunned, as a smile crept over Varn's face, and he didn't look back at the massive warrior. Shit, you know something about this, don't you? All this crap and you're involved. What you're saying is the king is responsible for all of this shitty situation? Celine said wide-eyed. Yup. That day, my life ended and hell broke loose on this land. I'm glad you survived, Oaken. But you don't understand. All the recent rise in the monster attacks, the creatures clawing away from the dark, and how the people are suffering more, is a result of that day. Hell spells, man. The war wasn't even supposed to happen. They didn't attack us. I found out that we started the war. The kingdom of Alvania started it, with the act of the new king. Vaughn growled as he shoved the stick into the fire. And I'm going to kill every last one of those bastards. And then I'm going to shove that massive blade down his throat and rip his heart out. Oaken lost his temper as he gripped a hold of the shirt of Varn and yanked him up screaming. Are you mad, man? Blimey! What the hell are you going on about? Hey, eh, Squire? The men, they're dead, right? Died and fought for nothing. Struth. They were attacking the border towns. They were... Shit. This is just like that day, isn't it? His grip loosened and Varn let out a sigh, understanding his rage. Oaken fell flat on his ass and they were struggling to understand what was being said to him. Varn looked down and then back at the fire. The rage flooded him as his eyes flashed green. And Selene couldn't understand what they were being told. And the younger soldier was shaking his head. Sarge, this, this is insanity. We should be shackling him up and dragging him back for treacherous words. Ollie said, scrambling for his sword on his hip. Celine's hand shot out and grabbed a hold of the young man's hand. She shook her head and said, What he's saying makes sense. At least about us being the ones who started the war. Alvania didn't win the war, but it came to an abrupt end. No one knows why, but the bordering kingdoms have intensified their border guards, but they aren't stopping the trade routes. We're still recovering and life isn't getting easier for the people. Unless you're an adventurer or a guild member. There's a lot more jobs for us lately. 
Not Ollie's hand dropped away as he looked over at the big man. He'd never seen the older soldier look so defeated in back of the red-headed warrior. Fear washed over him as the man stared into the fire, making sure the chicken was cooking as if nothing had happened. The silence weighted heavy on all of them. Varn knew what he was going to do, but didn't ask for any of their help. Oaken slapped his hands and chased the silence away. His grey eyes flashed with resolve as he firmly said, Yeah, go then, Selene, and take Ollie with you. I'm with you, Commander. As you can spot, I can still be useful. As Selene rubbed her forehead and said, Are you daft, man? Hell, you saw what happened here. They tore everyone apart and we got lucky. If there are more of these things, how the hell are you going to handle all of them? Even more so, they got some kind of master demon thing leading them. She refocused her attention at Varn asking, Do you have a plan at least? Hmm, sort of, but more like an outline. Anyways, it isn't your problem, and having Oaken with me would be a boon. Besides, my other friend should be here soon enough, with a little luck. Varn admitted, rubbing his chin. Commander was always good at sort of improving the fucking situation, Oaken said as he let out a sigh. Too bad I can't cop Amelia or Cruz's word. They were coming in an be. Those two survived also. I can't imagine that they stayed with the military like you, Van said, surprised. Ah, Cruz. Well, he joined the princess and became one of them holy knights. Amelia, well, she went to become a better spellcaster. Last I heard, she's an apprentice slash secretary to your brother. Oh, hellfire, your brother. I'd be shocked you're alive and he works on a council to the chaffing king. How are you going to convince him I'm all about this? He knows. In fact, he is part of the reason I am still around. Varn said with a sigh. Celine clapped her hands to draw her attention back to her. Hey, you two can circle jerk yourselves later. What you're planning is a suicide mission. Damn it. Can't leave you two idiots to your own devices. And probably make the situation a lot more worse. I guess I'm going to have to go with you. And Ollie shook his head and said, This is madness. What the hell are we all talking about? We survived and we should go get reinforcements to help us. If we hurry, we leave now. We could be back in a few weeks and then wipe out the threat. Trust me, kid. No one else is going to come. They move on the king's sea. Not on the word of a lowly soldier, Varn said, remembering what happened back during the war, and shook his head to bring himself back. You don't have to come, kid. You can probably get out of here before they even come for you. And if we fail, you're probably going to be silenced one way or another. I can tell you're a good soldier. Probably become a great leader one day. But today, we eat, and when dawn comes, we're going to ride hard to Wolfgar. But... You don't have to come. Go back. Tell them that the beasts have been dealt with. Selene smirked and nodded. <laughs> I get it. Even if we fail, some level of good can come from this. This will stop anyone else being sent here and getting killed at least for now. But you can build a resistance and gather men in secret to finish the job. And Ollie shook his head and said, I'm nothing but a coward. I couldn't even move. I stood by the horse the whole time. Nah, don't sell yourself short, kid. You warned us and came hammer and tack as soon as possible, innit? That took courage, Ollie. You can do this. Follow your training, right? And you'll succeed if we fail. I promise you, if we succeed, I'll send word, and you won't be kept in a bleeding dark. Oaken said, clasping his shoulder. Ollie wanted to cry and stifle the sobs as tears leaked from the corners of his eyes. He wiped the tears away from his face and nodded. Good. Well, that's settled. I am surprised you didn't fight us on joining you. Celine said, sitting down with Ollie and looking at the fire. Fear still gripped her as she screamed in her mind at what she was doing. Oh, I may be reckless and maybe an ass, but I'm not a damn fool. He sighed. Gotta take the help where I can. Anyways, you seem to be a thinker. I like thinkers. They come up with good plans. You're not bothered that I'm half-orc? Oaken half and said, 
I told you, right? Commander couldn't care less about that crap. Only roads, right? Seems like he hasn't changed that part of himself. I want a full story after we're done with this far, Commander. You owe me that much. And I'm talking about whatever changed you into, well, this. Oakham motioned to Van and to the massive black warhorse. I guess you are good at what you do, right? Well, Celine, that's all that matters to me and that you don't get in my way from my target. Anyways, I think the chicken is done. Let's eat. I am starving. Chapter 7 The Offer Let's get straight into that. Razak awoke and was blindfolded with his hands tied up. He had been put on a horse, just like a sack of potatoes. When he tried to demand to be let go, he was told to shut up. He couldn't understand how someone like him could end up in the situation he was in now. The beast had left him with his two men, he had guessed, and couldn't understand why the soldiers hadn't come to save him yet. Surely they had noticed he was missing. His scowl was visible when a birdie voice asked, Why are you scowling, Lord Butt? We have to walk while you get to ride the horse. I am a lord, noble, you swine. My men will come for me. Best you let me go, lest you don't want a swift death. Oh, your men. The man with the birdie voice spoke and slapped the horse's rear as he laughed hard. You have got to be kidding me. Shut your gobsmacker. We'll be there soon. Where are you taking me? There is no way my men can't find me. Vezak sputtered out in rage, and another voice, a bit more smoother, spoke suddenly. Aye, you think you have the loyalty of those men? I doubt you're a single one of them. Just peons to do your bidding, right? Mm, nobles like you disgust me, but don't worry. Because our master wants to see you. That's the only reason you're still alive and not a hollowed-out husk wasting in the woods out there, like the rest of your men. Wh what the hell are you talking about? They are trained soldiers of the Imperial Court. They would never lose to, to, to whatever that beast was. One of them versus those soldiers would be put down in no time. Rezak started the spout, and his face was grabbed hard as the man with a smooth voice spoke clearly, with a growl emanating from him, as if it echoed through Rezak. That growl brought his memory to the beast that had been in his tent, the one who had grabbed him. Your men were piss compared to my brothers and sisters, just a tasty snack to be chewed on. Count your blessing that your fat lard ass has been requested of the master. Consider us the welcome committee, Lord Fatass. Rezak couldn't help but understand what the voice was saying. The burly voice spoke as the blood drained from Rezak's face, as if he understood what they were saying. Mm, I think he gets it, Lucius. The beast and the voices he was hearing somehow were one and the same. The words echoed in his mind, his brother and sisters. Well, there was more than one beast, and he was obviously being brought to their lair or den. And he struggled again, and a hand smacked his face, stunning him. Oi, don't do that. We can't let you get hurt. That's right, Badger, so stop hitting him. Might as well gag him again. The one named Lucius said, with a slight chuckle, as he talked. Wait, wait, I can offer you land, money, power, whatever you desire. All you have to do is free me. I am a lord with favor from the king. Razak spoke quickly. Whatever I desire. Badger. You fancy something from the fat little lord? No, I have what I want. You say power? Hell, the master gave us that and we own these woods. No little snobby lord to push us around. You see, who do you think our master serves, fool? You were sent here to meet the master. A great honor. But I don't need to explain that to an idiot like you. You've pissed yourself. Your titles, money, even your men didn't mean anything. You still soiled yourself like a scared little boy, afraid of the dark 
but not to fear. The master set you right, as long as you're about it. Lucius growled when another voice spoke out. Very well said, my very loyal pups. I am so proud to have you return home once again, and I see you've brought our package with you. Resak felt fear invade every part of his body as he was yanked from the horse and tossed to the ground. The blindfold was yanked from his face as the light blinded him at first and everything came into view. He was not in some dirty den but was sitting on the ground in the middle of a town. A short, round man stood before him, wearing a top hat upon his grey long mane. His face was equally as round with a very sharp, large smile upon it that housed what looked like rows of sharp fangs. Rezak didn't stand as he could see the wolf-like eyes staring at him, deep amber with slits in them. The black surrounded him only enhanced what he saw, and he knew fear jolted every bit of nerve he had. The stubby man bowed and spoke so elegantly. Ah, greetings, Lord Rezak. We have been awaiting your arrival, just in time for the festivities to begin. An older woman wearing a black shawl over her shoulders, and with her raven-peppered hair tied back, as she watched the tied-up man be dragged off, a lord this time, apparently, as her hope seemed so dashed. The army had finally come and proved that they were worthless against the beast. Halligan looked her way and started to approach her as he tipped the hat in her direction. Ah, sweet Esmeralda, it's so good to see you this fine morning. Have you decided to finally join us? Esmeralda's hand shot to the charm she wore around her neck as her storm-grey eyes slanted. Oh no, no need for that, my dear. You really should just comply. You and the others could be, oh, could be so happy and free. And she spat at his feet. And lose our soul to your corruption? You need us to maintain the illusion so your little pest and need everyone that comes through this town. Tut tut, my dear Esmeralda. You should know that you are special to me. These people listen to you, look up to you. With me and you, we could make a perfect pair. I could give so much more uh, power than your little goddess. All you have to do is accept, and you will be young again, but even better. You are special, you know, to me. Halligan said, reaching out to stroke her face with his stubby fingers. She instantly smacked the hand away, growling out. Not a chance, not after what you did to my daughter and my husband. Speaking of which, haven't you seen that lovely granddaughter of yours lately? She is in good health, I hope. Halligan said, given a wolfish grin. She instantly knew he knew. She wasn't there. Her dear Vanessa had left long ago, but he never said anything or even showed signs that he knew. There was no way he could know, she thought to herself. She's just fine. Not that it's any concern of yours. She bluffed, but the stubby old man only laughed. Last I heard, she was seen heading towards the city. Uh, what city was it? Ah, yes. The city of Ostrava. I heard no one would hear her poor pleas for help. Don't worry, though. I know you fear for her safety and all. So I made sure to send some boys to watch over her and bring her home safely, of course. Halligan said with a smile on his face. Esmeralda growled out in fear. You're lying! He tried to slap him, but Halligan jumped from it, knowing exactly what it meant if he was even touched by her. I am many things, my dear, but I am no liar. What I offer you is power beyond belief. And if your children hadn't tried to stand in my way, they would be alive. Your granddaughter will be safe. I've ordered them to bring her safely back. We wouldn't lose anyone before the time was right. I recommend you take my offer and lose the charm. Trust me, it will be better for you to accept. To hell with you, you spawn! She growled out, and Halligan only laughed and bowed to her. My offer still stands, but I do hope you and the others will join us under the Blood Moon Festival tonight. It should be quite the night, Halligan said before he turned away, laughing hysterically as he made his way to the church. It smelled of rotten death 
as everything was hidden in the shadows around the entire building. They had dragged the Lord into the room, cutting him free, but then they clamped him down onto the floor with chains around his wrist. Lord Rezak yanked against them, struggling to get free, and to his surprise, the men who had dragged him had departed instantly, not saying anything. And fear rushed through Rezak as he thought about what he had seen and where he was. It smelled like death all around him. It was putrid and revolting, as he couldn't help but gag from the smell. Whatever content that had been left in his stomach, well, it was now gone. How? was all he could think. How could this have happened to him? It's quite a lovely smell, is it not, my lord Rezak? Halligan asked, stepping in finally, and moved past him. Who, who are you? Where am I? I demand to know! Rezak couldn't help but allow the whimpering demand to escape his lips. The round man turned and said, Ah, yes, you may call me Halligan, as it's easier than my true name. And you are in my town, the town of Wolfgar. I am the master of this town and rule over these woods, granting my blessing to these poor wretched souls, all for the one I serve, the one who set me free upon these lands. You and I serve such a master. I, I don't understand. How can such a beast follow your commands? Did I not say already? I give the gift of me. They have become stronger, faster, and better for it. You feel it, don't you? That fear that creeps into your soul. You pray to your goddess, and does she answer you? No, of course she doesn't. Isn't it tiring? I... Rezak looked down in shame as he knew. He was full of fear within his soul, and all of his being. After all, it was why he had never served in the war. All the rumours, the laughs behind his back, he knew all of them too well. If only he had true strength, he could show them all. He wasn't a coward. He could be just as strong as any of them. An image of a man flashed his mind, a young man with long red hair, and those mismatched eyes that stared at him, and the words telling him how truly, cowardly, he was. And if that man had lived, and he had the power, or he would rip him apart. He had been made a fool in front of the other nobles by that man. Now his twin brother was left on a council to advise his king. That's right. They looked down on you. Only your new king ever showed he believed in you, took to his side. But you know you deserve oh so much more. Think of it. Do you not thirst for vengeance? To show the fools how wrong they are of you? I know you think. Why doesn't the goddess love you like that man? Why was he blessed with Wisteria, and not you? Rage took him, and he slammed his fist into the ground. Tears flooded from his eyes, and he screamed. It's not fair. Even his low dog of a brother serves next to my king. Why him? Why that troublemaker and not me? Why did his highness abandon me to a pit of town not worth mentioning? And Halligan laughed and turned to face him. Did I not say we serve the same master? His Highness sent you to me to receive a gift on high. An offer unlike any that a god or goddess would give you. I can give you the body you so desire, and power unlike any before that has come. All you have to do is say yes. His Highness sent me to you? You serve my king? These beasts? Do His Highness's bidden is all. They are to become, hmm, your brothers and sisters. Rise above petty classism and look beyond that. Belong to something greater and lead the charge ahead. Halligan said with a wicked smile across his face. His eyes flashed red for a second and the fear washed over Rezak with something else. A desire that he had never felt before. He shook his head and said, That would mean my men, they... They were sent to their deaths on purpose. Mere sacrifice and payment to your new future. One that will excel you to new heights of desire, power, and more your appetite can handle. Halligan said, placing a finger under his chin. And he could feel the clawed finger under his chin. Do you, do you truly have the power to defy the gods and goddess, though? To change one's stars? 
Oh, my child, I will do more than change the stars and fast the gods go. Do you not recognize where you kneel? This was once the temple of Wystar. I have taken it from her. The whole land no longer is under her control. Halligan said as he stood up, extending his arms out. Blue flames erupted from the candles, illuminating the horrors before Razak. However, he was drawn back to the round man, who no longer looked so wrong. He stood so imposing, as if he had grown massive all of a sudden, as if he was more powerful than what he had previously was seen. So, what do you say, my child? Will you accept such a gift? Razak's lip quivered as he could see the possibilities before him. He knew that he only had to answer in one way. Yes, yes, grant me the strength no longer to be afraid, uh, to have true taste of power, and to become something that, that is worthy of serving my king. Chapter 8 Hope or Death well, The sun hadn't even risen yet, as Selina woke first. Surprised she had even fallen asleep. Exhaustion had hit her like a ton of bricks, and she hadn't even realized she had. And everything came back to her, rushing in as she looked at the destroyed encampment. She wasn't the only one who had passed out, as Ollie was curled up in a cloak, obviously having nightmares about the night before. The encampment had been cleared of bodies, and she realized a cloak had been placed on her. It made her scan across the encampment, realizing those two men were missing. And she let out a curse from beneath her breath, thinking they had probably left her behind. It was then that she saw the massive black horse, eating from a feed pouch, its armour on the ground to the side, along with Varn's armour. That was when Oaken approached with three horses in hand. Robin Hood to clock you. Up there, sunshine. It's Robin Hood you got some bow peep. It's going to be a long day. So, it wasn't just a horrible nightmare. They really did get killed and we're going to follow some crazy man. Who says he's going to put an end to this beast? Or rather, these beasts? She shook her head while putting her head into her palms. What the hell was I thinking? Nah, don't sell yourself short there, pretty. You know that you made the bloody right choice, but give the bleeding commander a chance, okay? Heaven and hell is, heaven and hell was, a Robin Hood geezer. And I like to Adam and Eve it that he's the same geezer deep down. After all, he did save us. Oaken pet the side of one of the horses. Besides, at least I was able to wrangle us up a couple of horses of our own. I figured the wagons aren't up to do us a damn good. I even got one for Ollie to ride back and put some distance between here. Nodding, Celine couldn't help but let out a sigh, looking back at Ollie. A part of her wish she hadn't volunteered to go along, but she knew this was important. You know, he could be setting us up to be part of whatever made these beasts. Anyways, where's the commander? And Oaken nodded over towards the tree lines. After I woke up, he was already taking care of the corpses, burning the bodies. Said we couldn't waste a nickel and dime burying them, so he weren't going to let them get scavenged on or eaten by the wild porridge knife or worse. And he felt sorry and sad that he'd burnt them and not given a proper burial. And Selene remembered how he had explained everything to the three of them about what he knew about the beast that now ruled this forest. Most of the town of Wolfgar had given themselves freely to become those creatures. Some hadn't and were trapped there, and the only reason he had known was because of the girl he'd rescued. He'd come as soon as he could to deal with the problem. The one who gave them this curse was called Halligan, and he had arrived soon after the war had ended. This man Halligan now ruled over them, and had some kind of plan for this rising moon. Van had stated that he was no man but more likely a demon. A fucking demon, she thought. Van had made it known that this was his goal, and that he intended on killing this man. No, this demon. She would have laughed at him and called him a madman if she hadn't encountered the beast man herself. The memory of them shifting back as they killed them replayed in her mind. And what did he call them? A general of descent? Well, apparently, there were thirteen of them, and they were all under the command of the king. And that they were the real reasons why monsters and creatures were causing so much havoc in the land. It was still hard for her to digest, but at least maybe this would put a stop to the beasts once and for all. She suddenly was moving without thinking about it as Oko Mili let out a chuckle and got the fire going to prepare a morning meal before they left. And as she approached the tree lines, she could hear the woof sound as air 
was being pushed. And to her surprise, she saw Van without a shirt on as he dropped the massive blade over and over again, raising a blade over his head while maintaining a solid stance and bringing it back down, but more impressively, with only one hand. His long red-black hair was tied back in a ponytail, as his eyes seemed to have a green hue to them. She hadn't realised it from before, but she could now tell that his eyes were also two different colours. One was crimson, while the other was light brown, almost gold. And even though it not seemed big, she could see his shoulders were broad, and he was very lean, as his muscles looked like tightly packed cord. It was the scars that caught her eyes, though. The upper body was covered in them, as there was a long one that came across his chest, where his heart would have been. Then it looked as if something had claws that had run down the side of his arm, looking as if something had tried to tear it off. And then his back it was a lot worse as they were more faded but still very visible. Those came across his back in different directions, even going over his shoulder, but it had a look of flogging, but that couldn't be right, could it? Now she had seen enough slaves and criminals receive such wounds. He seemed so intense, concentrated on what was in front of him, and she bit her lip and moved back away from him making her way over to Oaken. Oaken saw the look on Selene's face as she approached him, and she was looking behind her back at the forest line. It was the same look he himself had once had, and so many others who had served with the commander, and were close to the man. So you saw them then, the blooming scars on his hammer and tack. Selene was shocked when he said that, and she nodded. You said he was a lord, but his wounds are lashings. I mean, was he captured during a war? Or worse? Oaken shook his head and replied. Commander don't rabbit and pork about it, but his brother told us what happened. He was lashed in front of the bleeding people for causing disruption in the blooming main city, Chicken Pen, and he was a Rob Roy. He must have been a low-born noble then for them to flog him in public. I mean, that's the only reason for something like that, right? And Oaken shook his head and looked into the fire. That man's name is Vaughn Siran. Saran? As in the Saran family? One of, no, I dare say the oldest family in the kingdom next to the royal family? Is he like a bastard son or something? Logan shook his head and continued to stare into the fire. His brother, a twin brother I should say, is Dravan Saran, the chuffing young sorcerer on the king's council. I, Adam and Eve, the commander is older than the Boli of Glue. Everyone was aware of the name Dravan Saran. As a young child, he'd shown his prowess with the aptitude for magic and strategy for war. He was known to be the studious type and a big advocate for the common people. She then realised who this man was and that he had saved them. And she had heard of Varn before, from other adventurers and guildmates. Your commander, that man is Varn Saran, the war hero? Logan gave a big old smile across his face as she seemed to connect the dots finally. Commander of the... Infamous Black House is said to engage more enemies and save more towns than any platoon. I thought it was just talk or wishful thinking. Wait, you were a Black Hound? Yep. Commander there led us Jack and Jill to the Velden Massacre. And not enough of us were left and the commander was presumed brain dead. Nah, the king wanted our unit gone and unit commanders were either forced to take a lower position or leave altogether. But anyways, commander there got them scars making a scene freeing a bunch of slaves from the chicken pen. Well, it was illegal for them to travel through the kingdom. Now the king, well, he was a prince, took it as a stunt to deserve the rightful beating in front of whole lords and ladies. From what his brother says, not a peep escaped those lips at the nickel and dime of the beating, which in turn only served to gypsy kiss the prince further. It was the previous chancellor who put an end to it. Apparently, no one in the council would approve such a thing. Nor did they tell the crust of bread of the gaff Lady Valentina, Siran, about what was happening either. Ah, and it was Gypsy now to pay, unfortunately, since it was the prince and a form of punishment came of it. I did hear that the father was sent uh, the southern borders to serve as a commander, and then afterwards, wise the kettle, a knob over his soul, and that's how he ended up with the job as our commander. He was supposed to be it, detail from the prince. So, Farn hates our king, huh? Selene said, and then sat looking into the fire herself. Logan merely shrugged. I think he does now, especially with his claim, but he never complained or showed resentment over the situation. 
I've heard that he even would make the other nobles look like fools at times for stepping in his way. I could even begin to see that, Celine said, rolling her eyes. She let out a sigh as she heard a splashing of water. She looked over to see Van pouring the frost-cold water from a bucket over his head and shaking his hair like a dog. She had seen many nobles before, so far nothing of his attitude or how he fought the scream nobility. And throwing on the shirt, he came to the fire, kneeling before it, and extended his hands. So, what's the plan, Commander? We ride hard and try to get to the town as soon as possible. With any luck, the area would have been scouted. We can come up with a plan to deal with the problem. Scouted? You're going to tell me someone is already there and not eaten by those things? She asked, amazed. Van nodded and said, Oh, I doubt they would find him very appetizing, and he might just give them a headache and stomachache if they tried. Esmeralda pushed her way past the door and slammed it as she let out a breath. Fear gripped her as her heart pounded at what she had been told. Tears streamed down her face as she collapsed to the ground on her knees, not putting her hand to her lips. All the stress of everything hit her, how much she had already lost now. Given a small prayer to Shirax, she begged for guidance. Hopelessness was so heavy that there was no way out, and that the darkness of the beast threatened to swallow them all. Anger welled up within her as she slammed her fist against the floor, and all she could do was what she was doing now, but how much more would it cost her? You seem very upset. A voice spoke out, and she shot a look towards the table, sitting in the middle of her room. And there sat what looked like a small young man, wearing a red wide brim hat that had a tear in it, just enough to show those amber eyes. He was dressed like a noble, his large red overcoat tossed over the back of the chair. On the table was a pot of tea, and for the first time she realised that the fire from the hearth was wafting over to her. She scanned around the room as she scrambled up, grabbing a broom. The man poured her a cup and said, well, I'm sorry to barge in on you like this, but... I figure you were probably the one I should be speaking to. Who the hell are you and how did you manage to get in? Tell your master I'm not going to give in and this won't make me waver. Just get it over with. And the wards and barriers she had put in place weren't even disturbed. She had never seen anyone who could bypass her strongest spell. Even more, there was something more around it. Like a layer of something that could muffle the noise from within. Kai raised a hand. She could see his bandaged arms and recognize sacred text written along them. And it was containing something. It was darker than even Halligan, but it was just the arm. And she was drawn back to him as he spoke again. Well, I work for a man, but I wouldn't call him my master. More like partner in crime. You have my word. I'm not working with that. That thing over there. I'm guessing you are Esmeralda. How do you know my name and how did you get in here? She said, moving closer to him, getting a better look at this young face and his ears. He was an elf, the smallest or youngest one she had ever seen in these parts. Kai extended a hand towards the other chair, as she could smell the mint coming from the tea. Trust me, it's not poison. Your barriers are impressive for a priestess of Shirax, but I can tell they are weakening. I must take a lot for so many people. The tea won't cost you anything but a conversation, he said, taking his own cup and sipping on it. Her eyes flashed and she asked, What exactly do you want from me, demon? Demon? Oh yeah, the arm. That. That and I haven't told you who I am. Uh, you can call me Kai. I'm actually here to help. But I'm not the only one here to help you. The other one? My partner? Well, he's on his way, hopefully, but he's not going to save the people already cursed. You and the others have been resisting. will be okay, so as long as you don't get in the way. You don't understand. Wait, how do you know about the inflicted? The words of what he said echoed in her mind. Kai reached into the coat and pulled out a bloodied doll. He set it down and slid it to her as recognition hit her eyes. It was a granddaughter's doll. It had blood splashed on it, and she couldn't help but bring the doll to her chest. Did she at least go peacefully? No, she was a pain in the ass and demanded we bring her back here. She's with a friend who was a very good physician. He was able to save her and promise his minimal scarring, despite me healing her. Ah, she lost a lot of blood, but she informed us of everything. I've been watching. The fat round man seems to be more than he lets on. She was alive as she broke down crying and couldn't help but feel the relief from what she had been told. She stopped and asked, What about what Halligan said? He said that she was being followed. 
You must get out of here before he finds out about you. Oh, he's probably already listening to us now. Take my girl and run away as far. Kai interrupted her. Halligan, ha, huh. good. And I wouldn't worry about that. A place to bury her of my own to. We couldn't be heard talking. As far as your granddaughter goes, she isn't being followed anymore. In fact, those beasts won't be coming back here again. My partner, he already took care of them when they attacked her. And here's the rub. I don't know what the plan is, but if we want to save those not afflicted, we can't do it without you. So let me ask you this. Will you help us? Esmeralda took a sip on the tea, sat in the dough on the table. A smile creeped across her face as she heard what he had said. Her granddaughter was alive and well, it seemed. Her eyes flashed as she looked up at him and the amber eyes. Are you proposing to kill them all? Kai nodded, knowing she might want to save these people. And she set the cup down and said, And let's kill those bastards. Chapter 9 The Plan Ollie had watched the three ride off hard as they were, in a rush. Part of him wished that he could go with them, but what they had said was true. The three that he'd watched weren't normal like other soldiers he'd met before. He had pretended to be asleep when he'd heard the name of the man who had shown up. And for someone like him from such an old family to act that way, Ollie was noble, like so many of the soldiers he had gotten to know, and he had known why they had joined. Most had been discarded and branded useless by their own family. But there was no love lost between them, and a lot showed nothing but contempt for others. And there was always some kind of scheme going on, and there was always a level of arrogance with the main family members. He had heard once that his grandfather had said that it wasn't always like that. However, the war had changed a lot of them, especially those who hadn't even been to war. But he had always heard about Saran and nothing good, and that they weren't even people who worshipped the Weistra. And there are rumours that they entertained the power of devils to hold the power they had. One look in that armour, one might just agree, but there was something different. This one's a man who was looking for power, or trying to impress on anyone around him with that power. No, he let his own strength speak, and with an authority that didn't cross the line of arrogance. Van had convinced him to go along with a plan. He wouldn't fail to rally as many men as he could, in secret, if they hadn't returned. I wouldn't help if the Lord didn't return. Who would believe him, though? And I had to try and let out a sigh, as he reminded himself that he was not a coward. This was the real challenge for him, convincing others without the proof. Well, he would find a way, he swore to himself. He would not let the Black Knight down. After riding hard most of the morning, they let the horses rest by a stream, as they covered a lot more ground than the other two thought possible. Varn had explained since the beast seemed to come out at night, they probably wouldn't run into any real trouble, pushing hard. As the horses drank water under the shade, Selene scanned the forest, not sure if it was safe for them to take it easy. Relax, we're fine, and we should be there soon. Take it easy. Won't do us any good if the horses are tied out and die. Don't you think that they would have guards posted for riders to come up, especially in a forest like this? And Ogun took a drink from his flask and looked at her. Ah, you shall, but don't you orange peel it? It was different from the chicken pen we were riding down the road. Felt like Summit was watching us, but since we took the blooming forest, it's not as silent. And that feeling, well, it's disappeared. Either they're focused on the frog on a toad, or they think they're untouchable. Well, I think it's because of the demon that they are arrogant. They rip those soldiers to pieces like they were nothing. They don't believe anyone stands a chance against them. More than likely, they are all set up for patrols and probably haven't realized their comrades are dead. Farn added and looked out amongst the trees. Selene nodded, understanding, and said, Well, there is more life about than you could ever see game trails around here. If they are wild beasts, why aren't they hunting the creatures down to eat? And as soon as the words of the question left her mouth, she had her own answer. They didn't care to eat animals. They obviously had grown an appetite for human flesh. With enough merchants that had come through this roadway, the forest was too rough and there was only one long road through it to then go around would mean to lose precious cargo due to the fact it would take twice as long to go around. But more than a handful of merchants couldn't feed them, right? They are either sustained by the demon or they attack the townspeople 
You haven't been converted yet. Vaughn surmised. A voice spoke out from the forest saying, oh, I would say that they're being sustained by that Halligan fellow the girl spoke about. I see you brought some friends with you. Can they be really trusted? And they watched as the young man wearing a red overcoat and with a matching red brim hat came into view with his hands in his pocket. His amber eyes flashed in the sun as he came close to them, and he rubbed sleepness, bridge of his nose, before rubbing his jawline. Kai, I didn't think we were that close to you, but you always seem to have a way to move through the forest. Anyways, this is Selene and Oaken. They were part of a line of soldiers headed to Wolfgar. Kai tipped his hat towards them and said, The same Oaken that was in your unit, I presume. And I've heard of you, Selene, the Huntress. You do really good work from the stories I've heard. And I kind of wonder when the fat man was brought into town. And from what the grandmother told me, he's going to be given the option to receive the gift. He isn't the first one, from what I understand. Every blood moon or ritual was set up for something big. And so far, two others have come and gone. But she knows they didn't refuse the offer. They left different, changed. And we're not just talking about in attitude. They physically look stronger and everything. And Selene was surprised as she realised Kai was an elf, but there was something very different from others she had met, and there was something off about the energy around him. But more importantly, he wasn't wearing shackles. Ever since the new king had come into power, slavery was allowed, especially on the elven people. But once again, the Black Knight didn't seem to care about that, and was talking to the elf as if he were equal. You're a, an elf working with a human? Selene interjected, while looking over the elf. Kaya shot a look over to Varn and couldn't help but chuckle at what she had said. Oaken stepped up and cut them all off, saying, Did you say a Jack Sprat little geezer? Oh, that has to be that weasel, Rezak. That Jack Sprat bastard was spared, while the chuffing George Bess were turning to puppy char. I mean, it makes no blimey 18 pence, especially if they could use them. Because he'll say yes, Varn said, crossing his arms. I know he will. Because Rezak was a punk then, and it seems like nothing has changed. You know this man? Is that going to be an issue? Kai asked. Van smote and walked towards his horse. That won't be an issue, trust me. Anyways, I take it you scoped out the place. What are we looking at? Reaching into his coat, Kai pulled out a scroll from his jacket and laid it out in front of them. Oh, that's not going to be easy. And Kai explained how... Those who were infected with the beast disease versus the ones that were spread out between the houses. The people who had refused were initially protected by the priestess of Shirax, and she was maintaining the spell over their homes. This was taking a lot of her energy, and the assaults on the full moon were draining them. Esmeralda hadn't been able to reapply the energy or barriers because of Halligan interfering with the process. In fact, the land was being saturated in corruption. Each full moon brought them closer to death, as the beast attacked relentlessly, but generally avoided it during the day. They're more powerful than a normal human being during the day, but as the moon became full, the more power they gained, eventually taking on their bestial forms. There were at least thirty of them, not including Halligan. And when the old woman had been questioned, she was asked what Halligan turned into, and she told him the truth. She had no clue. All she knew was he was the first to come into the town, and he first destroyed the temple. She could still remember the awful screams that came from that place. She also noted how no one dared to approach such church, or even left the church after the incident. Nor were there any bodies removed from it also. And like the young Vanessa had told them, her father was a guard captain in the town. But when he tried to oppose Halligan, he ended up dead, along with the mother. The two were torn apart from those inside of the town, who accepted the gift. So... If we kill this Halligan fella, then everything goes back to normal, right? Selene asked. Easy enough plan. We slip in, cut the head off the servant, and all of this ends. And Oaken frowned and said, I think they're being influenced by that Halligan person. Can they really be responsible for their actions? They could try to live out the rest of their lives seeking pence from whatever god or goddess they worship. Kill them all is what the old lady said, Kai replied. If for what, Giza? How is that a Robin Hood response for? People have had their entire lives taken from them. It's not like they had a choice after seeing something look like that. I mean, even the blooming man left in the church was corrupted and 
That's the goddess of Isle of Wight herself. Wystra. How can you even hold them responsible? Uh, I mean, Commander, you can't take what he's saying seriously, can you? Of course we can. They all deserve to die. In fact, that may be the way to go. Burn the whole damn place down. They won't know what's coming. Hit the town just as the sun goes down. The smoke will mess with their senses. If the church is their so-called den, they move to protect it. You know, like a pack of wolves. Van retorted while rubbing his chin. Oaken and Selim both stared at them with shock, not understanding how he could even think of such a plan without batting an eye. It was almost as if he didn't hear what they were saying. No can grab Var by the shirt and yanked him towards him. If you kind of lost your senses, Gazer, you'd easily kill an entire village than to get one bloke. Do you want everyone to think you're some kind of scumbag, Gazer? Ogun screamed at him in the face. And what infuriated him more was that Varn didn't even react as he stared at him in the eyes. Selim was sure the big man was about to strike him again, and she couldn't believe that someone would suggest a thing that was truly that merciless. And it was then that she remembered hearing talk of soldiers and people in passing about a bounty that wasn't a bounty, and she began mumbling to herself. I've heard about this, this so-called bounty for a dark night that was issued. I mean, there hasn't been a wanted poster or anything, just whispers and rumours at the tavern or around the guild. And I heard that it was for crimes against the people of Alvania and the crown. Some kind of devil king or usurper. That armour, those weapons, I can't be. Ogun let go with a mighty push as he looked at Varn in horror and shook his head as if he was about to become sick. And Ogun finally managed to growl out. I remember in something about your royal carrier showed up with, with a message about a black knight or what not, inciting rebellion and slaughtering nobles, and riding and leading a small army, killing wee town folk. And Varn stared at him, unflinching as Oaken shouted, again grabbing him by the shirt. I oh, see you son of a bitch. Is this because you're looking for vengeance or an entire kingdom of Alvonia? So help me, I'll cut your damn throat where you stand, depending on the answer. Kai's hand grabbed the big man's wrist while looking Oaken in the eyes and said, Do you see some kind of army with him? Hell, from the sounds of it, you already know the war started all those years ago. Not to mention, he brought you with him because you wanted to help. Normally, he sends anyone that wants to help away. Takes the whole damn burden on by himself. Ogun let him go and spit to the side and finally said, But they deserve a chance to get back to normal life. But if we kill this Alagun Noggin, then they can have it back. Killing the corruption is our uh, best bet, but how do we do that? People are going to die one way or another. Selene said, looking down at the map. I'm not sure what I want to believe myself, Sergeant, but he did save our asses out there. Yeah, but... Ogun started to say as he clenched his fist, but Kai was the one who cut him off. But nothing. Look, it's not as simple as just killing one of the generals of the scent. No matter which one is in the area, no one just goes back to normal. Each is a condition to create their army. And this one requires consent, according to the shaman. These people, they chose to become these animals. They kill and devour, not because they're being forced to, but because they enjoy it. They aren't going to be happy if, and that's a real big if, they go back to human. Nakai could see the other two's shocked face as the reality of what he had said sunk in, as Van had that cool look on his face still. You know that man has a heart on for you? If they still insist on following you, they should know why. What exactly does that mean? Who is this so-called man? Selene asked. Van sighed and closed his eyes before he looked at Kai. Damn you, Kai. Advarian Philip Alvena. Alvarian? As in our king? The royal family Alvana? How did you manage to gain the ire of the royal family? Selene asked shout. Not the royal family, just Alvarian. Besides, the bastard just won't die. The only way I can kill him is taking out the generals. And how the hell do you know that? Oaken asked, as suspicion crept over his voice. And Van Sider had, had a wolfish grin cross over his lips as he remembered that night. When this all first started, I was angry, full of rage. I went after him, stormed the castle, so to speak. 
Why, you should have seen his face when he realized I was alive. The smile faded, and he said, But he can't be killed. Hell spells he isn't even human anymore. Neither of us are. What does that mean? Selene asked. He shook his head and said, We are wasting light and we need to get a plan in place. Like I said, we killed them all. And Selene let out a sigh and knew what he was saying was true. Ogun seemed like he wanted to say something about the whole thing, almost as if he was disgusted and confused by everything that was being said. She rubbed her chin and it all came together in her mind. The problem was the people who weren't infected were scattered about. What if they were together in one location? Who? The beasts? Van asked. And shaking her head, she replied, uh, No, the people who aren't infected. Can we put them in one location and somehow protect them? They aren't at fault and they are technically hostages. What do you think? Van looked at the map and nodded, agreeing. He put his finger on the map and said, Here, your arrows. They said fire to things, right? Yeah, why do you... Oh, I get it. Then we go with the original thought. Burn the whole damn place down. Selene said, and Oka nodded, rubbing his moustache. What do you think, Kai? Van asked. Can the old lady do it? Kai had slipped in past the walls and made his way into the house that sat at the edge of town. It belonged to Esmeralda, who was impressed that the sharp-dressed elf had returned. Master Kai, I didn't expect to see you back so soon. He touched the brim of his hat and looked out the window before he turned to look at her. Let me ask you something serious. Your power is weakening, protecting every home at night. And she nodded wearily. Yes, he gets even stronger on the Blood Moon nights. This won't be any different, but I'm worried that we're going to lose people tonight. The others, they don't understand, but how am I supposed to save them all? Oh, your friend is better to stay away during these nights. Come back when the moon has waned. They will be weaker and I will try to prevent anyone from dying. That's a nice thought, but let me ask you something. Can you fit everyone in here? I noticed that your home is on the outskirts of town. That's why. Kai asked. And Esmeralda nodded, but understood why he was asking such a question. She could protect them all in one place, but re-establishing another barrier might be impossible afterwards. Not to mention the destruction of people's homes and property would take place. Normally I would agree, but I, I could even put up a stronger barrier, but can't say if I'd be able to do that and establish a new barrier. If I did, not to mention, their homes would be sacrificed in the process. Oh, these beasts, they don't care of personal property or home. They would torture and taunt, given a chance. Well, let me ask you this. The price are you all willing to pay to have your freedoms back? Would you give up your homes and this land, just for a chance to have a normal life back? Kai asked as his amber eyes seemed to consume her, dragging her into his thought. She knew the answer as tears ran down her eyes. Yes. Yes, damn you. Are you saying for us to run? Sacrifice some so that they can act as bait? Kai shook his head. No, but I'm afraid you'll have to give up your homes. You must gather them here by the time of the moon rise. I think my friends will be here by then, and you need to be ready. No matter what you hear, no matter what happens outside, you must all stay in here. Do I make myself clear? And if we don't? Kai shrugged and moved towards the door. Then you will die. So can you do it? Can you convince them and move them in here without alerting the Halligan fellow? Do I have a choice? And shaking his head, he said, well, I suppose not. May your goddess look after you, and hopefully, by tonight, well, this will all come to an end. Chapter 10 Festival of Blood Let's get straight into that. Halligan looked down at his newest child changed and bones broken down, changing a fat man into something greater than he was. Now he was proud as this would help spread his reach even further. It had been good since he had awoken from his time being imprisoned. How much would the world have changed since his time? And how weak the humans had become since the past? Hell, he knew exactly what the reason was for that. The king, who had been a prince at the time, came to them seeking power. Well, they weren't his first choice as the boy tried to gain power from the stuck-up primordial dragons. While he was there, he found out that the so-called king was not of the royal bloodline. No, 
he was rejected, finding out that he was just an adopted child, never to ascend to the throne. That was when Arvarian saw true power, the kind that only his brothers could bring to an arrogant little human. They liked him. He was bloodthirsty, angry, and just the vessel they needed. All it cost him was the lives of his people, but if they knew the truth, then they would have rejected him. There were a total of fifteen of them, giving him a taste of immortality. The king was now their brother, and he would serve them for their war against the primordial dragons. The problem was finding out whose families were tied to the blood oath. The royal family was tied to Alcat, the dragon of the sun, and as long as they took care of the princess, well, that wouldn't be a problem. However, it's already too late to stop the most dangerous of the lot, Zira, the black dragon a creature that was just as chaotic as they were, and used to lead her crusaders across the land. Since the Black Knight had appeared, there was no denying that she was very active. They had lost two of their brothers to her, so-called champion, during the sacrifice, leaving only the thirteen of the original left. He had avoided them since, and was probably searching for allies to fight. This made him smirk as he only wished the Black Dragon's Knight would dare to step onto his threshold, so he could make it beg for death. And so, he had managed the two of his siblings. It was only cause for surprise had been on his side. They were well aware of him now, and had decided that trying to corrupt one like that, oh, it would be impossible. Death was the only answer. He had said to kill the whole line off, destroy the family of Siran, but he had been denied. No, the oldest remaining son had been put on a council to keep an eye on him. And they acted as if they knew nothing, and it seemed like they treated the moment as an honour to work for the king. If they moved, the king could end them if necessary. And it was then that his attention was returned to what was happening as Lucius stepped into the church. How goes the preparations for the feast? Your new brother will surely be hungry tonight, Halligan said with a smile. Yes, master. We were able to move those merchants we picked up. They are locked up and ready for the feast in the centre of town. I am a little worried about the others. Roll and the others still haven't returned yet. Lucius said as he flinched as Halligan stared down at him. When it was something cold and terrifying when those eyes locked on him. He kept his head down, showing his submission. Why so worried, Lucius? You have brought something concerning to me, and it is odd that they aren't back yet. However, not all are as in control of themselves as you are. As obedient as you are. Don't be afraid, though. The moon, it will be high tonight, and very powerful. I am sure they have let their hunger get the best of them. When they return, you will punish them for me, Halligan said with a wolfish grin. There was a sigh of relief, and he looked back out the door. One other thing, Master. The people. They all seem to be on the move, though. Maybe they are worried about the witch's spell. It might be fading. A constant assault seemed to be having more of an effect on their homes. And Halligan clasped a hand on the shoulder of Lucius and said, Ah, very much so. She can't establish new barriers and probably afraid that they will fall tonight during the moon. They are going to her home, probably strengthen her barrier to protect them. She will be mine. Might do enjoy those who have faith. He looked back over to the inner church, seeing very clearly, the body stacked on the altar. Lucius still couldn't shake the feeling he had. Something wasn't right. Roll wouldn't have just given up so easily. But he didn't want to risk making the master angry, and he wanted everything to go right. The blood moon was important to his master, but he hated that these nobles that had been brought here were given such a power and gift. He was so much stronger than they were. It made him jealous. Halligan knew what was on his mind. The moon will be rising soon. Let us join your brothers and sisters in the choir of the night. And the moon was rising, and the scream started to begin as the last of the families made their way into the sanctuary of Esmeralda's home. And before closing the door, she gave a high-pitched whistle, allowing the others to know that it was time. As she slammed the door, one of the men asked, Are you sure that's the right decision? I mean, how will we survive in this home? with all of us crammed inside. Esmeralda looked at them and said, I know this is frightening and 
It is confusing, but I will tell you the truth now. One way or another, this ends tonight. We either survive the night and rebuild, or we die. That is our options. And the children were frightened as they could hear the screams becoming housed with so many of them. Even through the crack of the window shutters, she could see past most of the homes. Others transforming, tearing away at their clothes as they fell to the ground, bodies contorting and reshaping themselves. Halligan stood near the church with arms spread wide, welcoming the moon. The town folk who remained untainted knew this, as many who lived closer to the church had seen the ceremony play out time and time again. And with captured people caged as those who changed into the beast did so right in front of them, sacrifices to be hunted, and with Halligan setting his men on them to be hunted. But it was special for tonight, for the newest lord he would take charge and would lead the hunt. And they always came off as more savage, less in control. And Esmeralda took a deep breath and said, No matter what happens, no matter what you see through the cracks of the shutters, you must not leave. Before anyone could ask why, she rose her hand, commanded to sit where they could, to stay away from the shutters. She herself sat in the centre of the room, refocusing all of her energy onto the home. It made the barrier even stronger as she did, and she could feel the pull of the earth, and as all of her energy that had been spread out came back to her, coating the house, it became stronger, almost as strong as a castle. Oh, Shirax, hear my words, goddess of the forest, protector of our land. I humbly beseech you, grant strength to my people, and help these men honour their word, and end this horror once and for all. She uttered out loud for all to hear, as she felt the land shake. An explosion happened somewhere near the house as it came out of nowhere. The ground shook as there was another explosion over the sound of the howls. One of the villagers ran to the shutters of the window, looking through the slits. It's burning! The whole village is starting to light on fire! The villagers all started to clamour towards the windows that they could see. Esmeralda slammed her hand down, open palm, catching everybody's attention. Everyone, just stay where you are and remain calm. But at homes, one started to say, but she cut them off. Do you want this hell to be over? This is the price we must pay. As long as we remain, we can rebuild. And the burly man shouted back, It's not your home that is burning down. You're not losing everything you are. And rage flashed in her eyes as he instantly regretted saying those words. He slumped back down to the floor as his wife gave him a stern look. They all knew what she had lost, what she went through trying to protect them, night after night. Esmeralda pushed it from her mind, knowing how they felt about losing their homes. Another explosion happened, and she could swear she heard the whimpers of the dogs being hurled about. Had they brought some kind of siege weapon? It wasn't done by magic, as she would have sensed it, but it wasn't. She knew that if they found this, it would be the end of them. All of them. She clenched her hands together, praying harder to her goddess. Well, this had to work. What other choice did they have? On a hill that overlooked the town to the northeast corner, the huntress was setting up several arrows to fire as she picked her spots where she was going to shoot. Celine had redone several arrows in preparation before they started the assault. She had figured by putting more of the explosive fireballs together, it could make a bigger bang. This would help light up the village and get things started. They had to make sure they made their way fast to town, just in time for the sun to set and waited to see when the villagers would transform. This way, they wouldn't make it to her location till the damage was done. And for this, Kai had been watching them closely, ready to make his way back to her. And while this happened, both Hogan and Varma at the edge of town, ready to charge in. And Kai appeared and said, oh, There might be a small problem with the plan. They have people in cages in the centre of town. It looks like that's what's on the menu tonight. And Celine shook her head now, understanding that if they back out, there wasn't going to be a second chance at this. She drew the arrow and stated, The rest of these people have put their fate in our hands. We can only pray Westra watch over them till the job is done. And Kai smirked. Ha, huh, I can see why they call you the best. Let me ask you this honestly. Are you sure those things are going to do what you say? I could throw a few fireballs myself to get everything rolling. And Celine smirked and said, Let us get this festival started, little man. 
I'm going to need you to watch my back if they manage to get up here. And besides, the more of those damn beasts we can light up, the more those two can handle. As she watched as Kai had a devilish grin come across his face, where he started to undo the bindings around his left arm. Just the hand alone, exposed was red and black, with talon claws coming down to each finger. She was taken aback as he stretched a hand, and it seemed bigger somehow. Ah, don't worry, your pretty little head. I'll catch it back. And there was a thrum from the bowstring as the arrow sailed through the air, down to the people as the bright blood moon rose high, and the sun seemed to run away from it. The screams like the other night started up again, as they echoed through the forest, and it suddenly changed with the explosion. There were whimpers and yelps as the fire started to spread, and she yanked the special arrows, launching them towards different areas, creating a giant plume of fire. And Kai let out a whistle at the explosion that brought an impressive smile on the young huntress's face, that he was impressed. In reality, they were a lot more effective than she thought they would be. Her face turned grim as she finally asked, oh, Let me ask you seriously, do you think they can handle what's coming? Without missing a beat on where she was shooting, Another explosion happened, and she could already see the shadows darting forward, coming in their direction. A round man stood by the temple as he was pointing up at them. Oh, I don't know much about this Oaken fella, but this is what that man does. I think he may have some anger issues and needs to get him out of him, Kai said, and then started moving back down. Evan had left sleep there behind, closer to Selene. He had given the horse instructions to get the girl out of here if things went south. He had placed all of his armor on and kept his shield slung on his back. He carried the massive sword in his hands while he had a short sword strapped to his side. Oaken looked very menacing with his raven helmet strapped on and chain shirt over his body. He held a simple round shield held in one gauntlet hand while the axe was resting against his shoulder. Oaken tapped the side of the helmet with the butt of the axe and could feel his blood start to boil. He looked over at Varn and asked, Like old times, huh? Should we play that game? Well, Varn thought for a moment. Yeah, let's play body count. The standard wager. The old man laughed and said while looking to the other end of town, along the outskirts. You're on, little commander. Let's hope you've gotten better at this over the blooming donkey's years. The plan was simple. They would have to split up and carve a path towards the centre of town. The explosions and fire would help provide cover in the scent. Not to mention, they could throw them into burning rubble to take care of them also. He turned his attention to the first explosion, and the flames licked upwards. But there was no time to waste, as they would probably go after Selene. And with enough explosions, they might thin them out, and at least she had Kai watching out for her as they took care of the bulk. At least with them, they would be the perfect target or meal for them. The cruel beasts. There was no reason for them to go for her first, not with such tempting easy targets in the town itself. And as he whipped around the corner, he was not surprised that some of them were already getting up from their transformations. The beasts that weren't on fire let out a feral howl that echoed through the streets. Their eyes were blazing red, and saliva dripped from the sides of their maws. Their elongated lips twitched as their clawed feet clicked and clacked off the road, and they crouched ready in themselves to strike. Their clothes were torn and covered in blood from the transformation, and they hesitated for just a few moments. They were part animals, and he wondered if their instincts told them to hold back, or if they were waiting for the master's order. Well, Varn said, dragging the massive blade across the ground behind him. What are you waiting for? An invitation to dinner, or just plain chicken shit? counted about four of them together as another came around the corner. Another explosion happened near them and they cringed as fire whipped up in a frenzy, catching more homes on fire. And Van was tired of waiting as he had to move quickly to get to the center of town. He charged forward as the first turned to see him whipping the blade around and smashing it down upon the head. This set the others into motion as another pushed off its hind legs, trying to catch him in a charging jump failed. Varn whipped the massive blade back up in a sweeping arc, catching it mid-air and slicing it in half. The other three were shocked, but two more charged as he let out his breath. And twisting on the balls of his feet, the massive blade came around with the flat of the blade, striking the two together. 
The impact of the blade did more than just send them to the flaming building, as the bones could be heard cracking with the strike. The Black Knight was already moving towards the fourth creature, who was stunned by what he was seeing. It wasn't so much the blade that had managed to cut his packmates down, but the fact that Varn had a smile across his face the entire time. His eyes glowed faintly green, but it was something dangerous in them, making him seem almost inhuman. And before it had a chance, Varn took advantage of it, bringing the massive blade down and around, cleaving the beast in two. Black blood splashed across the ground, and he didn't even stop moving forward, not looking back at the others. The fifth beast was already leaping to the side, trying to catch him off balance, but Van dropped to one knee and thrust the massive blade forward, catching it on the blade. The blade's razor edge sliced through its flesh, slicing through the organs as well, and with a hard heft, Van threw the body into a flame as it slowly turned back to a human. Can you feel him? He is nearby. The female voice echoed in his mind. The closer you get, the stronger you become. Farm mumbled something as he moved forward. He could feel the rage burning in his blood begin to boil, as it almost overtook him. He swung the blade, allowing the black blood to splash to the ground as he walked down the road, deeper into the town. Then, as he turned the corner, he felt something slam hard into him, and he was sent spiraling into one of the homes that were on fire. Chapter 11 Against the Ropes Let's get straight into that. Oaken raced along as the axe glowed brightly and yanked it from the corpse of another werewolf, bringing his count up to six. The beasts were disoriented by the explosions and fires going on around them, and he wasted no time. He let out a roar as he charged in, driving the axe head into the wolf-like creature's head. As another came after him, he would bring up his shield into the muzzle, forcing it closed and sending it rearing backwards. He yanked the axe out while kicking the corpse to the ground. He could see some had been caught by the explosive arrows, but also by the fire that was igniting around them. Oaken drove forward, shield up and whipping the axe about, catching it in the ribs. The beast tried to push the shield down with a whimper of pain. Its clawed hand still had power to it, but he yanked the axe free, twisting his might frame to force the creature off the shield as it stumbled backwards. The axe came about again, fast and hard, as it drove into the base of the neck, and black ichor splashed out from its wound. As he yanked it free, the body flopped to the ground, lifeless. And soon, it already became human again, as fur drew back into its body, bones cracked back into place. Oaken grunted uncomfortably as he watched the scene and could still hear the pain of their transformations in his mind. Why in chuffing gypsy now would you put yourself through all this lot? Well, at least I can end this miserable existence for you. And just as he finished what he was saying, another beast was coming, racing on all fours. He brought up the shield, charging forward at it. The two masses collided, slamming into each other. And he was surprised as he'd never felt anyone hit him as hard before. The beast swung down hard with its clawed hand, knocking the shield to the side before trying to rip at his stomach. But despite how big Oaken was, he was still spry, even for his age. And twisting with the blow, he brought the axe around straight into the massive arm. The axe head wedged into its arm, and the beast let out a howl that rang through the street. Then the beast swung wide, striking at his head. Oaken threw up his shield, blocking the blow. The impact made him fly to the side, and he was soon chased after by the beast, snarling, outstretched hands trying to bite him in the process. And as he rolled up, he clenched hold of the axe, driving it up into its chin. The momentum caused it to fly backwards, smashing teeth as well as splitting its maw. As soon as it hit the ground with a thud, Oaken jumped into the air, driving the axe down straight into its chest, and black blood exploded upwards from the impact as he drew it out with a huff. Then, he quickly scanned the area, catching his breath. He finally saw his way was clear as he stood up, and Oaken stood up and wiped his mouth before he made his way towards the church again. He knew that it was in the centre of town, and the route he was on had been decided while they went over the map. And he was surprised so many hadn't gone past him or even jumped from the rooftops. He wondered if they were afraid of the fact that they might go boom with the buildings. This brought a chuckle to himself. He charged forward, 
and knew he would be there soon enough. When another beast came charging at him, and it was suddenly struck by one of the exploding arrows, bursting into flames. And looking over at the hill, he couldn't help but let out a whistle. Heaven and hell, ain't that bloody impressive. From all the way blooming up there. Ah, she's got the minerals. Another beast rushed out, charging towards him. It was simple enough to throw them off game, but the second one leapt out at him, and hooking the axe head on one of the burning timbers, he let out a grunt as he threw it straight at the pair. He struck one, but the second beast used it as a springboard to leap even higher at him. He dropped to a crouched position, raised his shield in anticipation for the impact. And just before it could reach him, with outstretched clawed hands, he pushed upwards, slamming the shield into its snout. A crunch was heard, echoing through the street. The beast tumbled, scratching at its muzzle as it tried to reform its bones. Hoken let out a battle cry and rushed at the beast, just as it could see and make out the blurs, and the burly warrior was already on top of it, driving the axe into its head. He couldn't help but make a bolster in laughter as he whipped around to see the other beast was now pacing in a semicircle, staring him down. And recovering the timber, Hoken yanked the axe free and banged his shield to taunt the beast. He let out a roar and shouted, What are you waiting for, you blooming mutt? Come and take the Marilyn Reese if you think you can. The timber fell, and flames caught up the walls and smoke covered the room. Van had been smashed through the wall and let go of the sword from the impact. And as he rolled up, he pulled the shield off his back and tightened the strap against his arm. A deep, guttural growl turned into laughter, drawing Van's attention towards the beast. Well, aren't you a fancy lad? I am surprised you didn't burst like a blood pack when I hit you. You look like you might be fun. Well, if you still had that big old bleed of yours. Never heard of something so damn idiotic. Did you think it would make you look big and tough? That my brothers and sisters would just run from you? Oh, you got lucky with me finding you first. I'll set you straight. The wolf said, pointing clawed thumbs at himself. Van, merely smart, Realizing that the fool didn't even realize his so-called brothers and sisters were already dead behind them. The fool was arrogant, and Van replied the only way he knew how. Tell me something. Do you enjoy licking your balls, or does one of those other males do it for you? The beast snarled as he became visibly shaken with anger, as its red eyes flashed with rage. Its large black fur became ruffled as the pointed ears went flat back, and it finally let out a snarl. <sighs> You disrespectful little man ape. I'll tear your beating heart out and eat it in front of you. Blah, blah, blah. You done flapping what little gums you have. This place is getting hot, and I got plenty of assholes to kill before the night's through. Especially that ball licking, prancy fat little man you call a master. Vaughn said while bringing his shield about, ready for the hit. The beast crouched and took off in a rush, charging at Vaughn. And so far, he was much faster than the others he had faced off against. The impact was solid, and if he wasn't preparing for it, he would have been sent flying through the building again. The beast rolled after the impact, and was already back on its feet, charging at him again. This time, it dropped its hand down, racking its claw down against the shield. This forced him down to one knee, but Varn's hand was already reaching for the gladius strapped to his side. When the beast thought it had the advantage on him, it swung its clawed hand out, gripping at the edge of the shield. It tried to yank it from him, but there was something wrong. There wasn't any resistance to it as the arm swung wide. His other hand shot out towards the chest when the gladius came in hard through the chin and through the maw. The force made the maw slam closed hard, and Varm was sure he heard teeth shatter with the impact. And there was a stunned look of confusion in the beast's eyes. He didn't seem to understand how he could be in such pain. Van twisted to the side once more, and back again, before he shoved his foot straight into the chest, sending the beast flying back into the wall. The blade split straight down the moor as the black blood exploded everywhere, and as it hit with a thud, he heard what sounded like a low and a roar mixed together. And he turned to see another beast, this time probably close to nine feet charging at him. This time, he didn't stop to wait for the impact as he leapt to the left, rolling. The beast slammed into the wall, but Varm was already scrambling to the entryway. Get up, Badger. What are you doing? The damage wasn't that bad. 
Why, don't you move a muscle, you sub. The tall black wolf growled out, pointing a claw finger at Van. And Lucius couldn't believe how much damage the blade had done. Halligan told him to find out what was happening as the explosion started. Badger had always been quick to transform into his wolf form, but slowly turning back into a human. He often thought the muscle-brained idiot was more the animal than the human in the first place, but he was needed. Lucius was their leader, stronger, but Badger was an enforcer, and damn good at it. The fact that when he whipped around the corner, seeing the bodies of his fellow villagers dead, and they were sliced apart in their human form, they weren't regenerating at all. His sharp eyes shot to the burning building hearing Badger's voice, and it was something said before he watched him try to attack the armoured figure, and just as soon as it had begun, it was over as he watched Badger being kicked to the side. He let out a mighty howl and charged at him, and despite wearing armour, he noticed how nimble the man was by rolling out of the way and taking off towards the doorway. He looked down at Badger and saw that his face had been slashed open. Get up, Badger. What are you doing? The damage wasn't that bad. Oi, don't you move a muscle, you sob. As he pointed at the knight, who was making his way through the door. And then he heard it, the bone snapping back into place, the black blood pulling on the ground beneath Badger. He wasn't just injured, but somehow this man had managed to actually kill him. The armoured figure drew up what looked like a massive sword from the ground and slammed the blade into the ground. Lucius always listened to his instincts, and this one was dangerous and didn't smell right. It wasn't a man standing in front of him, but something more ancient. Lucius cocked his head and asked, Well, what the hell are you? His nerves firing, telling him to run, the sense of danger that oozed off of him pissed him off. And no matter how many times others had been changed by the master, he was never afraid of them. They were stronger than he was, but he was more alpha than they were. They accepted to erase their weakness inside their souls and flesh, but that was not why he made the decision. No, he accepted the gift because he felt he deserved it and stayed to serve his master. This man, oh, he was a threat, a threat to his master's plan. He let out a low growl and fell to all fours, pacing in the flame room as it grew. The glowing green eyes stared at him, there was no fear coming from him. I'm sorry. Did I kill your boy toy there? Why don't you come over and I'll send you to your sweetheart? Ho oh. ho, Lucius said with a chuckle as the claws clicked and clacked against the ground. You got a mouth on you, don't you? Don't worry, I'll just make you my new plaything. And a man smiled and waved his shield in a motion to come at him. And just then the roof partially collapsed in kicking up dust and smoke as flames licked high. Lucius kicked the timber, flying out of the building at the night. The shield came up, knocking the timbers out the way, and Lucius took advantage. His powerful muscles exploded as he cleared the distance, ripping through the crumbling home. The knight saw him coming down from above, and it was a click, and sliding out from the massive man's form, a straight double-edged blade that was thinner than the massive curved blade it had been. It came fast and hard, but he was able to roll before it could plunge deep into him. It nicked his arm as he landed and turned to face the man once more. The blade stung and pain erupted from the cut as he swore he could have heard a sizzling noise when it touched his skin. It was more than just the blade, as he thought only silver could hurt them. But the weapon wasn't silver though, it was some kind of black steel that swallowed the light. The knight faced him, drawing up the shield in front of him, and drew the sword back once more. The unflinching eyes stared into his as two more of the villagers came to join him, whipping around the corner in a frenzy. They didn't stop at all as they growled out something. Stop, you fools! Lucius shouted, but it was already too late. The shield slammed into one beast as the sword flashed fast, catching the other by the neck, and lopping off the head with ease. Without hesitation, the black blade cut down and stunned the beast, plunging the blade deep into its heart. Lucian charged forward just as the blows came swiftly. The knight turned in a moment, but before he could slash out with the sword, Lucius caught his elbow. He let out a howl of pain as the spike coming out from the counter pushed through his hand, burned like the blade had, but it also prevented this man from striking out at him. His claw wrapped the arm, intending to twist the arm and rip it off, and it was then the pain exploded 
in Lucius's foot. The shield edge had come down, biting deep into his foot, and Lucius twisted his body, sending an armoured warrior flying through the air. It was a loud thud as Lucius moved away, looking at his hand. The black blood dripped heavily from his wound. He should be healing, but he wasn't. Somehow this man was causing him to bleed. He turned, sneering at the knight, who was already closing the gap between them. The blade came down and Lucius tried to back away from it. I barely missed him as he narrowly escaped the incoming blow. But a knight, well, he was relentless. He tried to move away from the attack, but with his injured foot and wounds, he couldn't move away fast enough, getting caught by the bash across his face with his shield. This disorientated Lucius, as the black blade slid without effort into his side. And the knight stared into his eyes as the slide of the blade bore deeper inside of him. You fought very differently from the others of your kind, but in the end, you all will die. In response to what he was saying, Lucius tried to bite his face off. The warrior ripped the blade out as his black blood exploded everywhere, and he fell to the ground. He was gasping for air as he felt the tip of the blade resting against his neck. Who, who are you? Who the hell are you? Lucius managed to get out before spitting up more black blood. He started to change back to his human form. Dead men don't need to know my name, the man said as the black blade slid through the spine and throat. Oaken finally made it to the centre of the square, where he saw the cage people and a round fat man standing with a giant smile across his face. The warrior looked around and let out a whistle as he was surprised not to see more resistance from the beasts. You there! You! You're not one of them, are you? You, you gotta get us out of here! I, I can... I can pay you! Oaken was surprised by the man babbling in the cage. Halligan didn't even move towards him or take his eyes off of him. My, my, you certainly are a big fella. It made a bit of a mess on your way here. Ah, you must be bleeding Jack Spat, little geezer. Who's at the blooming centre of all of this? Well, I was expecting, uh, something grander than this. What are you going to do with these fools? Eat them? Not me, per se. However, they are on the menu. I take it that axe of yours is pretty special. I recognize the runes in it. Can I ask, what brought such a man as yourself out here? Halligan asked, ignoring the insult, still smiling. And Ogun rubbed his chin and said, I was sent here to kill the beast with this lord and my men. Your pets make quick work of most of my men. I'm here to collect on that debt. So, you care to settle that matter of debt? And Halligan thought for a moment and asked, how would you like to be the greatest warrior ever? I can give you body and a power unlike anything you have witnessed before. And with you by my side, I dare say that you will be incredible. What do you say for compensation for the loss of your men? I have a cat proposal there, Gazer. I'll take a crust of bread. You can apologize to them in Gypsy Nell for what you've done. You've got to get us out of here. Another merchant begged, interrupting the two. Oaken looked at him and retorted. Ah, quit your belly aching. You're probably safer in there than out here. Don't worry, the bloody matter will be solved soon enough. So what'd you say, you little bastard? Alligan shook his head and said, Well, that's a shame. I am afraid we won't be able to come to an agreement then. However, I do believe you should take this whole affair up with your lord. Oh, Lord Rezak, would you come on out? I believe your subordinate has something he would like to discuss with you. If you wouldn't mind taking care of this matter for me, I would most appreciate it. Teach him how foolish he really is for me. Master Halligan turned to walk away towards the church. Oaken wasn't going to take such a disrespect as he brought the axe up to strike, but was stopped dead in his tracks. It was then a massive beast with dark grey fur stepped out from the church. Ah, Master Halligan, you caught for me? Oh, it is you, Sergeant. The little peasant that thought he could... You always thought you were so much better than me, didn't you? 
just because you fought in the war, acting like some kind of hero. Well, I'll tell you what you're good for now. Something that might satisfy this. Hmm. Hunger that I have. Well, the voice was cracked and altered, in a rough, gravelly voice, but he knew it was Rezak. That level of arrogance and that look of those foul red eyes. Ogun took note that, in his bestial form, he now overtowered him. His form looked like a massive dire wolf standing on its hind legs, or with massive black daggers at the end of each fingertip. The long maw was full of razor-sharp teeth, and the parts that looked human were massive muscles. Couldn't have it the normal way. Just had to get in shape, finally, because of some blooming demon. Did you not have any Jekyll and Hyde? Oaken growled out as the axe head glowed again. Rezak moved fast as Oaken didn't have a chance to even brace for the hit. The massive fist hit him, sending him flying backwards and knocking the wind out from his lungs as he slammed into the ground. He managed to hold onto his weapon, though, as he rolled onto his side, coughing and tried to regain air in his lungs. The merchants were screaming in fear, desperate to rip the gate of the cage. Rezak gave a menacing smile at them as his red eyes seemed to glow. Oh, don't worry. I'll get to you all soon enough. The beast tapped the cage's bar, the drool slipping down from his maw. You look like a little twist and twirl, Ogun said, standing up again, bringing his shield in front of him. Rezak seemed as if he took steps and was already over Ogun. The clawed hand swiped upwards, striking the wooden shield, and splinters flew everywhere as the shield exploded on impact. Ogun's arm felt the vibration of pain explode upwards, holding what was left of the straps. He focused all of his attention on trying to push past the pain, swinging the axe as hard as he could towards Rezak's side, but it was stopped as Rezak kicked him square in the chest. He let out a gasp as he could feel the claws rake across his chest through the chainmail and managing to tear it also. And as he rolled, he let out a scream, finally, as he couldn't believe how much it hurt. He fought to regain some air, trying to fill his lungs, Get up, you fool! He screamed in his mind as he tightened his grip on the axe. And summoning every ounce of strength, he tried to sit up, ready to take his axe in both hands and try to strike as hard as he could. Rezak let out a laughter as he slammed his foot down on Oaken's chest and pinned him to the ground. The giant warrior of a man tried to swing the axe, trying to get him off of him to no avail. The fact that Rezak didn't just slam his foot into him, only meant that this creature and fallen noble had a plan to torture him. And he did just that, as Rezak caught hold of the arm of the axe, and then pulled hard with a rip that echoed in the night, followed by Oaken screaming. The warrior watched as he lifted the twitching arm up, as he didn't merely just slice it off. No, Oaken had felt the twist that came as every inch of muscle ripped and was twisted as the arm came off still holding the axe. The light faded from the ruins, and Rezak held the arm over his outstretched maw, letting the blood leak down into his mouth. Oaken was starting to fade out and in of consciousness when he felt the pain of Rezak pushing his foot down to make him stay conscious. Oh, don't you dare die just yet, peasant. I'm going to rip you apart till I get to that heart of yours, and I'm going to enjoy every delicious bite. So, what do you say? Shall we go? For a leg, or maybe the other arm, Rezak said, throwing the arm to the side, along with the axe. The arm thud could be heard, but the axe never hit the ground. Rezak wondered if it had hit a house or somewhere else, and as he turned to look behind him, he saw the runes explode to life, with a green hue to them, and the man holding it with a massive sword in the other hand. Get the hell of my soldier, you one nut mutt, the armored man shouted pointing the axe at him. Chapter 12 The Church of the Wolf Let's get straight into that. Rezak turned to face off against the dark armoured figure as something triggered within him. It made no sense as fear and anger welled up inside of him. No, he refused to believe in that fear as he was now the superior being and this, or this was just a man. Maybe it was something from his past life, but he had been given the gift. Letting out a low growl, he stepped down hard onto Oaken one more time before he kicked him away. 
The old soldier let out a groan of pain as he was easily moved like a ragdoll. Good, Rezak thought as he would finish what he had started after he had dealt with this man. Van spat to the side and mumbled, Hell spells, now why would you go and do that? Now I'm going to have to teach you a lesson. You talk a big game, little man. I am a noble. A mere peasant like you doesn't deserve to speak to someone such as I. I shall teach you what it means to be such a noble wolf as myself, who is above you by ripping your tongue out and making you watch as I eat your friend in front of you. The beast said, pointing a black clawed finger at Varn. Varn slammed the sword into the ground and brought the axe about. Rezak, you simply never change, do you? Always throwing that status around like it means a damn thing. I'll teach you yet once again, you fat little bastard, just how inferior you really are. That voice, those words, struck a chord as he remembered them. He could see the long red hair flowing behind the night. The memory of that day came back to him, and he growled out. Impossible! You are dead! The king told us all about what happened to you on that day. Oh, did he now? Well, I can tell you that I am very much alive. What exactly did he tell you? Did a couple of demons popped up and slaughtered everyone in their wake? Oh no, let me guess. I foolishly underestimated our enemies and led our men to their death for my own glory. Van R. stepping towards Rezak. No fear came from those eyes as a smirk crossed his face. Rezak stepped forward and raised to his full height. His rage overcame and he extended his arms out to his side to loiter in over Van. He looked down at those red eyes flashed in a blood moon and he growled out. Are you saying he was lying? I shall teach you once and for all to respect our king. Come now in face of true power of those nobles who serve his. Rezak was cut off as Varn didn't let him finish what he had to say. No, Varn had had enough of his talking as he kicked as hard as he could into Rezak's crotch. The pain exploded through Rezak's body as he dropped down to his knees while letting out a long drowned out howl of pain. And as the knees hit the ground, Varn was already kicking him into the center of the chest, sending him flying back. You won not mutt. This is the middle of the battle. No time for your monologuing. This shocked the beast, as he was supposed to be stronger and invincible now. How? How was he being humiliated again by this man? The memory came back of being in the throne room and how Van had talked down to the prince at the time, before he became the king. Van had openly defied his highness's orders, and that was when Rezak tried to put him in place and Van had kicked his feet out from underneath him without a second thought and drew his blade at his throat. And just like then, he started to piss himself as the Black Knight made its way towards him. Fear rushed through the wolf's body as everything told him to run. Rezak swung wildly, trying to strike Van, but instead the axe cut deep into his forearm. The blade felt as if it was igniting his blood on fire, and unlike anything Rezak had ever experienced before. The beast tried to turn away, run from Van who kicked at him in the back. The axe came down into the shoulder, slicing through with ease. And Rezak started to scream, but the Black Knight didn't flinch, grabbing hold of its ankle and dragging the beast towards the church. Black blood spraying out everywhere, and the wound wasn't healing at all, and the arm wasn't regenerating at all. You would have probably gotten a quick death, but no, you had to be an asshole again. He threw the wolf and drew the axe, slicing off the leg below the knee. Rezak screamed in horror, but it didn't stop there as the axe came down again at the other leg. Rezak was in so much pain as everything seemed to darken around him. His body was already starting to crack and shift back into his human form. And there was a swift kick into Rezak's ribs, forcing him to come back to reality as he raised the bloody stump to his face. He let out a horrified scream as the reality set in, and then the metal foot slammed hard into his chest. And as it fought for air, the axe head came straight down into his head. 
You shouldn't have done that to my friend, Vaughn said, yanking the axe out. He then turned and ran over to the cage with the men who were all panicked. Can any of you do first aid or know how to tend to wounds? And they quivered in fear, looking at the black bloody mess that was Rezak. And finally, one spoke up and said, I, I do, sir. Help him, Van growled out and smashed the chain holding the cage door in place. And I swear, if any of you run or he dies, I will make what I did to that creature a thousand times worse. We need to get out of here, sir. We can grab a cart before we were trapped in this inferno or worse. Let more show up. A fat and short merchant babbled out as he was scanning the area. Vaughn grabbed him by the shirt and yanked him up, saying, I suggest you or help my friend and not worry about the situation. He tossed him to the side and started to walk towards the church again. He grabbed up the massive black curved blade as he did and slammed the axe into the chest of Rezak, making sure that he was truly dead and not getting back up. Rage started to well up in his chest as he growled out, Halagon! Where are you going, sir? A lanky merchant shouted after him, To sort the situation out. Vaughn mumbled under his breath as he made his way into the darkened halls of the church. Nasaline watched him from the hilltop, and so did Kai. Something didn't make sense as she was firing the arrows down upon the village. Yes, it was burning, and the surprise of explosion that was happening would have disorientated anyone, but they would have realized where she was. And they weren't coming. In fact, this, well, this shouldn't have happened. They aren't coming. Why aren't they trying to stop the attack on the town? Celine asked, scanning the burning town. Kai slanted his eyes as he scanned also, noticing they were ignoring the town, but were going after the two, cutting their way through the centre of town. They're trying to run them down. They don't give a damn about this town. Why don't they? And Celine grabbed up the remaining of her arrows and said, oh, I'm going down there. This isn't right. Something is wrong. That fat round bastard didn't even transform. He just stood there and isn't freaking out as explosions are happening around him. Well, Kai said, tipping the hat. We were told to stay put, but I think they are going to have all the fun. I can make it down there fast by myself, but I can't bring you with me. She was already by sleep near, as she leaned close to the black warhorse. She rubbed the side of the horse and whispered into his ear. Easy, boy, easy. I don't know if you can understand me, but I need your help. I know your master would want you to take me to safety, but, but I need you to take me to him now. And the mighty warhorse flipped his head as if he understood what she had said. Kai helped her up and she gripped hold of the reins. She gave a click as the horse let out a massive snort before he turned, reared up letting out a mighty whinny. The mighty black horse pounded the ground, kicking up dirt as the pair charged down into the town. She was amazed at how much power the warhorse had. She had rode many horses in her time, but the stallion was unearthly and she could barely hold on to it. Kai had also vanished before she even reached the bottom of the hill. And as they approached the town, most would have been pulled back and have to be coaxed into such a dangerous situation. But not this horse. As it trampled in without even hesitation, and she knew he could smell the beasts that lay in wait. And it was then that one of the beastial townspeople jumped out trying to tear their legs out from sleep there. Instead of being startled, the horse turned, avoiding the swipe and doing a double barrel to the side of his head. She heard the crack, loud, smashing the skull to pieces with ease of the impact. And just as the feet hit the ground, another was already trying to jump out, leaping to tackle her off of the saddle, but it was caught by the muzzle. The red-clawed hand appeared out of a black wisp, catching hold of the face. And there was a muffled scream as black flames erupted around its face and it was slammed hard into the ground. And Kaya stood up it instantly vanished into what looked like a similar black wisp. She didn't have time to contemplate what she was seeing or try to even understand what had happened. Kai was no ordinary elf by far, nor was the owner of this horse. And she could see why Oaken had so much confidence in his old commander. And even now she'd see bodies were laid out on the ground, cut apart. And this horse also, she could see how well trained it was. We have to hurry, boy. I think he might just need a help. 
Nevan kicked the doors open and made his way into the nave of the church as an awful stench hit him. It caused his eyes to tear up from it. This wasn't the first time he'd been around rotting corpses before, but unfortunately, this would probably not be his last. And standing just where the moonlight touched from the doorway stood Halligan, with his arms behind his back. Well, I must say, you made short work of that Lord Wolf, didn't you? I am surprised to see someone like you. Oh? Van asked, whipping the blade up to be, up against his shoulder. And what kind of a person would that be? A human so ruthless and fearless. They are still human, you know, just improved upon. Why interfere with our corner of the world? For some gold? Well, you've killed enough of them. You could just say you killed the beast, collect your reward, and be on your way. Or... Halligan twirled his hand as if he was going to offer something. Or what? You'd offer me the same thing that you offered Rezak over there? <laughs> I don't think so. Accepting something from one of your kind would just make me want to cut my own paws off. However, I'm pretty sure that job isn't done. Yet. After all, I haven't killed the beast yet. Van said with confidence as his green eyes flashed. And what do you know of me? I am just a simple servant, servant to spread the power to those who have none. I don't think someone like you could even begin to understand, since you seem to be blessed with... He waved his hands towards Varn's body. Such strength and determination. Can we get this over with? I'm getting sick of standing in your demon stink, and I'd like to wrap this up ASAP. I got a lot more of you to hunt down before I can kill that bastard. Varn said, dropping the blade down and spreading his feet, ready to attack. And Halligan realized it, could smell it now. This was the man who had killed his brother and sister all those years ago. This was the Black Dragon's knight, and he had come for his head. He stepped back into the shadows of the church, and despite the darkness surrounding him, he could still see as Halligan tried to hide himself in the shadows of death. The round fat man began to transform, but it was different from the others so far. His skin and muscles started to split down the back as if he was wearing clothing. And as it split apart, blood splashed everywhere, and the black fur spreaded out with a tiny pop noise. His form swelled out, growing towards the banister as his large canine muzzled open, exploding forth rows of fangs that were like swords. He didn't just have black clawed hands, but several more arms ripped from the side, long and wiry, like an insect's arms. Mandibles pushed out from the side of the muzzle, and his dark green eyes seemed to flare alive. Slobber dribbled down from the moor, and the sconces erupted to life with blue flames to reveal thousands of corpses, piled up behind him around the now desecrated altar. Halligan fell forward, still overtowering Vaughn, before lifting his head to the rafters, letting out a mighty howl that rumbled through every part of himself. I know who you are, little man. You made a mistake coming here, little man. I will teach you the true power of the General of Descent Knight. Hell spells, Van mumbled beneath his breath. You are a big fucking bug, aren't you? Halligan let out another roar, angered as Van had flinched even a little at his impressive size. Instead, he could see it on the man's face clearly. He was smirking. Oh, this sent the demon into a rage as he charged forward, and in a flash with one clawed hand extended out to catch him. The black curved blade flew hard and fast unexpectedly as it bit deep into the hand. The fingers came off at the knuckles, sending them flying in different directions. Halligan screamed in pain as he was surprised by the fact that he could even do such a thing. Before Vaughn could come back with a counter, the other massive hand came sweeping across in a back fist motion, sending him flying backwards. And everything went white for a moment, as Vaughn felt the air exploding out of his lungs, and the stone wall caved in behind him. He forced himself to stand as he brought the blade back, and he saw that Halligan's fingers were already growing back. This time, he didn't wait. Vaughn took off running at the demon before him. 
Halligan swung again while twisting his body around, trying to strike Varn again. Despite carrying such a blade and being fully armoured, Varn proved to be just a bit more nimble than the demon as he rolled out of the way. Then, before the beast could even move the hand away, the black curved blade slashed across the arm and Varn moved closer in. Coming back around, the black blade slashed upwards, catching it across the body, and black blood oozed out of Halligan as he roared out in pain. His fist came across striking Varn and throwing him into what remained of the pews, and wood exploded all around him as he rolled, still holding on to the hilt of his sword. And just as he was about to stand, he fell to his knee, just a little disorientated from the hit. He was breathing hard and sweat beaded around his forehead. And that was when another clawed hand shot out and grabbed a hold of Varn, squeezing hard. A short burst of pain blew through Varn as he gasped out in pain. He then felt the rush as he was ripped up from the floor and the air passing him, slamming hard into the floor again. And he grunted in pain, clenching his teeth in pain. This happened one more time as he was smashed into the ground and could feel the floor give beneath him. Fear my power, little knight. He felt himself slammed again into the floor and felt as everything was going black. Halligan was hovering over him, staring down at him as Varn's eyes shot open. Still alive, are we? And even unbroken? <laughs> I am impressed, little knight. How about it? What do you say? Abandon these people. Abandon these gods. Come serve me instead. Halligan growled out and sneered, moving closer to Van. Van tightened his grip on the hilt and coughed up blood. Halligan shoved him into the ground again and smiled triumphantly down upon him. It was then that Van slowly opened his eyes and spoke. Hey, asshole, look up. Halligan looked at him curiously as Van just smiled a long toothy grin. That was when he looked up at the doorway and something flew from the doorway. It was an arrow, but as it hit his eyes, there was an explosion. Pain and fire sipped through his eye as the flame ignited, causing incredible pain which made him reach for his face, releasing Varn in the process. The Dark Knight rolled to his feet, drawing up the massive black blade in an upward arc, slashing up the belly towards the chest. And before Halligan had time to react, the blade came down, slashing its leg in the process and forcing him to drop to one knee. Varn spun on the balls of his feet and backed away holding the sword out in front of him. And Halligan screeched, spittle flying at him. His face was grotesque, but with part of his face damaged and wasn't able to regenerate. And it was then that Halligan saw it. Those glowing, green eyes shifted and completely changed to a deep purple. Fear actually enveloped the beast as he could feel it and almost heard a female voice. Your time is up, devil! The clawed hand came fast, stretched out and trying to claw at him, but Varn moved out of its way by sidestepping it and retaliated by bringing the massive blade down, slashing off the arm just above the elbow. Halligan noticed he was stronger, somehow more powerful now, and there was a surge of something that threatened to consume him. The massive wolf didn't care about the pain as he swung his other hand down upon him. The black blade came fast and hard, slashing through the palm and thrusting into the ribcage before Var let out a roar of his own and yanked it free. Halligan let out a roar of pain and anguish before driving down, attempting to bite him in half. But Varn sidestepped out of the way, and as his head came down, the mighty jaw snapped hard, trying to take something if he could. One good eye could see Varn, the sweat pouring down his head. Streaks of blood smearing down the opening in his helmet, and those purple eyes stared deep into him. Time seemed to slow down. He couldn't move fast enough as the ridiculous black blade came down fast and hard. And the black blade cut smoothly, as if there wasn't any resistance beneath it. The spine offered no resistance as tendons, muscle, all seemed to rip away. And the head fell with a plop as the demon could fill it. It wasn't just that he was dying, nor was it that he was simply slipping back from the plan, back to hell. No, it was the power he had. Every bit of strength that was his to command wasn't just released for him to regather 
once more, and it was pulled out of Halligan into the night. You son of a... Halligan tried to growl out. Fuck you, was all Varn could say. And then it hit him, like being slammed by a bolt of lightning, coursing through every inch of his body. He let out a scream and collapsed down to the ground. The ground began to shatter, and the windows exploded as a wave of energy knocked everyone to the ground. The flames were instantly extinguished as the land felt like it took a deep breath and finally exhaled. Chapter 13. The Sun Will Rise. Let's get straight into that. Celine looked at the charred remains of the demon wolf. She was surprised after the head came off. The green flame exploded, engulfing the entire body before releasing some kind of wave. She could have sworn she had seen something come out and into the commander, who laid on the ground breathing hard. He finally sat up and took off his helmet letting the cool, fresh air coming through the building hit him. Well, when they had first come in, they had smelt the corpses, but well, everything was different. All the corpses were gone, also, as if ignited on fire when the beast died. She could feel it. The place, oh, it was completely different. Within the whole village. Just, what the hell were you thinking? She growled out, looking down at Van. Well, he said, looking up at her. I knew you'd have my back. She scoffed and said, Bullshit, you got damn lucky. If I hadn't been here, you'd been dead. Is he alive or am I going to kill those idiots? Van asked, exasperated, from everything, and then extended out a hand to her. Celine reached down, taking his hand, and helped to pull him up. Oh, I don't know. I saw what happened to him, but I rushed in here to help you instead. Besides, I don't do healing, and unfortunately, I don't think anyone could reattach his arm. Ah, uh, hell spells, he mumbled under his breath. He didn't deserve that. Let me ask you something. How did you make it here so damn fast? I took your horse, she admitted. Something didn't make sense at all. They didn't even retaliate when the village was burning or tried to stop me. However... They were dead set on protecting the centre of town and this chapel. And so Kai and I made our way down here. That traitor. He always disobeys me. Where is that elf? He always leaves me to die. I beg your pardon. More like cleaning up after you. Some of the stragglers have already fled. I think to the north. I don't know why, but I think losing their so-called master has put fear into those who I didn't catch up with. Now that you actually killed the bastard... Well, how does it feel? Everything you were hoping for? Kai said, appearing from the black wisp again, his hand now bandaged back up. And to be fair, I am exhausted to feel anything at the moment. I am worried about that lughead. How is Oaken? Did you stop to check on him or are you able to help him? And Kai tilted a hat and shook his head. I saw what happened to him on the way in here, but to be honest, I don't know. Let us count our blessings that he was not infected by them, but I believe he will survive. But he has lost his arm for good. I don't know if there's anyone, but that man could have saved his arm. But I believe it's already too late for that. And speaking of that man, should I tell him to let that stubborn little girl come home? And Van nodded and said, Yeah, I suppose so. And he stopped as he could see the confusion on Celine's face as he realised they were talking as if she knew the physician. Oh, uh, you got a look of confusion. The man we are talking about is a strange healer of sorts. We call him the physician, but his real name is Tao Ren. He came from the east, beyond the borders of Alvania. He is from the kingdom that originally kept the demon sealed. Some kind of mystic mumble-jumble crap. His order sent him, I guess, in search of the demons to deal with the problem. Don't get me wrong. He has magic unlike anything we know here in the kingdom, but he has a pretty good handling of anatomy. I can't even begin to describe how he works. This so-called mystic can even reattach a missing limb. She asked, raising an eyebrow. She couldn't believe such a person could exist, let alone with magic able to do what he was claiming. Ivan shook his head as the three walked towards the threshold. 
Kai knew what she was thinking and asked for them. He wouldn't use magic to do it, but it might as well be. Needles, threads, and other such equipment. Teo is a very interesting fella and won't kill anyone if he doesn't have to. Stick around and this man and you might get your chance to meet him one day. Akai stopped and watched as the two exited from the building. He tipped his hat to the two and spoke as he slipped his hands into his pockets. I'll be taking my leave then, Van. Give my regards to the shaman. I'm going to go leave to get the girl. It might take a few days, a week at most. Van nodded in understanding and smirked. Once again, I owe you. Maybe meet you down the road sometime. Yeah, it's funny how we always run into each other, but... Huntress, maybe I'll see you around. Celine nodded as she wanted to ask more about him, but understood why he was leaving. She gave a nod as he took a step into the shadows and vanished. The other two looked at each other, and Van nodded as she helped him out of the stone chapel. Esmeralda and the other town people were walking through the rubble of their homes. She bowed as tears flowed down from her eyes, as she said, You are the one who slew the beast? It was as if you could sense it coming off of Van, or he was not natural, like Halligan, but somehow very different. Dangerous, but not to them. And she bowed her head and continued saying, We cannot thank you enough for coming to our aid. And the merchants all sat up, helping the massive warrior sit up, who had blood running down his mouth, but a huge grin upon his face. Yes, we have you to thank that we didn't end up dead. Your friend will survive. Ivan let out a sigh of relief as he crumpled to the stone steps and relaxed for a moment, sitting there while breathing hard. Exhaustion wafted through every inch of his body and the pain came suddenly. He let out a little chuckle as he could hear her voice again. You did good. Better rest up. It's only going to get harder from here. He clicked his tongue, remembering the first time the dragon had approached him on that day. Everything had stopped and she walked amongst the corpses, unaffected by everything around her. She wore a black gown with her, long black locks flowing behind her. Curved horns were hidden by them, but he could make out the tips. She looked like a young lady, and she had asked him if he was ready to die. Varm was drawn back to reality as the sun started to peak somewhere behind the wall, as the night sky was blood red with clouds everywhere. And one of the townspeople spoke up, saying, What are you going to do? Leave? Move to one of the bigger cities? We have nothing left. Esmeralda then asked, saying, No, that is not true. This is our home and we shall rebuild it. We can do this, because we are not victims but survivors. Will you stay and help us? Looking at Oaken, he had a thought and answered firmly. Nah, if I stay here, I only end up suffering more because of my presence. But that man there, oh, I think he'd be better suited to help you. Alvardian had been in the middle of a morning council when a carrier had arrived with the news. It had the report from Wolfgar, but it was not the one he had been expecting. Even though he was raged by what he had heard, he suppressed it as it only reflected within his eyes. Jacob Siran sat the closest to him, saw the flash within his eyes. Unlike his brother, he had short red hair, and both of his eyes were unnatural brown, but they could easily pass for one another. He was always wearing simple breeches and a simple dress shirt beneath the long black cloak. He wore leather gloves that had intricate runes sewn into them, and as he had explained that they helped with a focus when it cast its spells, and Jacob spoke very calm and would even tone most of the time, making him seem very aloof for, that he lacked any real emotions. Soon after the war had come to an end, he had been summoned to take his place amongst the council of nobles, helping to sort through the kingdom's affairs. Now because he had shown a lack of aptitude for physical combat, he had trained his mind. Not only was he a successful practitioner in the arts of magic, but he was a skilled strategist, He'd often come up with the ways to ease the trouble with commoners and did so without the risk of getting the ire of the king. This allowed him to be able to speak casually without fear of retaliation from his highness or other nobles. He didn't seek accolades or even glory, and he was very different from his brother. Is something the matter, your highness? Jacob asked, seeing the distress on the king's face. He slowly closed the scroll and put on a grim face. 
Unfortunately, it's good news as well as sad news. It would seem the beast of Wolfgar has finally been disposed of, but in the process of doing so, most of the men dispatched have been killed, and Lord Rezak was among the dead. The town people have sent word that it was a survivor of the Veldan massacre and a half-orc ranger from the guild. The man is Oaken Greythorn, but he received a very devastating blow, losing his arm in the process, while this ranger seems to be in good health. They have started to take care of Greythorn's injured, but they regret to inform us that they have no magistrate to govern the town. They made a request for this, Greythorn to take up such a role and help rebuild the town. I will assign a new lord, though, to oversee the town, and we will let this man retire somewhere where he can live out his days peacefully. We will send the required gold to the Hunter's Guild for her participation in the matter of the Beast of Wolfgar. Now the others started to murmur about what he had suggested. Most did not want to give up their comfortable position, and were about to argue amongst themselves who should take it. And that was when Jacob slapped an open palm against the table, drawing everyone's attention to him. Your Highness, I think that it would be ill-advised. This would only serve to weaken the towns and cities and noble lords will govern at the moment. However, why not let this man take over as magistrate as reward, instead of paying him a hefty sum of gold and hoping he is not bitter about the situation? We give him a chance to better the town of Wolfgar. I have heard that he is a very capable sergeant at arms. In the first place, and so far off, we wouldn't have him attend the council meetings. Just so you know, send us a report to inform about the situation or how progression is going along. Once it starts to thrive again, we simply remove him at that point. And the men in the chamber all agreed but Jacob could see the annoyance in the king's eye. He finally nodded and said, Ah, as always, you do come up with a brilliant plan, Councilman Siran. We shall go with this and send an official right establishing this man. Now, with that out of the way, shall we continue on with other matters at hand? And Jacob smiled inwardly, knowing how much the king hated this idea, and something else was shown that he suddenly caught on to. The sweat down his brow. The king was nervous, whilst also being furious. And Jacob took that to heart and went back to paying attention to the man talking. Van had to be involved in this whole situation, but he couldn't ask just yet, not while those pesky prying eyes were still watching him. The rage exploded through his entire being as the chamber hall had been emptied. Jacob being the last one to leave, Avadian could not believe that this was all happening all over again. That day five years ago, we played over and over again in his mind. That man was behind it once again. Van Siran was truly a damn thorn in his side and his plans. And a shadow appeared as a female voice spoke. You seem troubled, young king. What ails you this time? Another of our brother has been killed. Halligan is no more. The king said, slamming his fist down onto the table. The figure stepped forward. Her long silver hair flowed freely behind her. She wore a long black overcoat, and with that had a blood-red fabric for the lining. Beneath the coat, she wore a silk blouse top tucked into her breeches. The vest over it matched her coat, black with a gold trim, and with a matching set of knee-high black boots. And she remained within the shadows, just out of reach of the light. She walked over to the king, and brushed back the blonde curly lock away from his cerulean blue eyes. Are you sure of this, my king? She asked and then saw the flash of anger in his eyes. It sent shivers down her spine and then she chuckled a little. With that kind of rage, I'm guessing that it could only be the Dark Knight. Who else could it be? I have yet to see anyone who had the ability to take on one of you. Some random warrior was able to kill Halligan. There are very few people that could have done it, and they are all connected to that man. How could this one man be so strong? The king said as he subconsciously touched his chest. The memory lingered within his mind what Varn had done. He had done what no other had managed to do. He 
cut a path into the palace, defeated the ogres he'd placed in the palace, and even managed to do some damage to him. If it hadn't been for the fact that he was protected by the Romanian generals of the Scent Pact, he would have died. Rage filled him once again, and he slammed his fist down hard onto the table. Say the word, my king, and I will scour the land. I will leave death in my wake and hunt him down to the ground and bring you his head. The female said, leaning closer to him. No, my countess, you have other duties to attend to. Esme could smile as she knew what he was speaking of and bowed her head. I understand, my lord, and don't worry about that man. So long as we twelve remain, you cannot die and will always come back. As tragic of a loss as our brother is, his part has been done so far. With those he already converted, they will be able to spread the mark of the wolf. There will always be those who are willing to follow for power, and your army of beasts will grow along with the others. And, as far as your sister goes, she is already headed to the temple of Asmoria, home of the relic of Wisteria. Once she arrives, she won't be leaving there alive. I will be there to oversee everything. Now Vardian couldn't help but smile at how Esme reassured him of everything. He had decided to take his own precautions, though, sending along an assassin to finish the job. He walked to the side and grabbed a hold of a bottle of wine, pouring himself a large glass. Never trust a demon, as he had made sure not to give his entire trust to them. They served the purpose, and with that his plans would come soon enough. After all, he had time. Chapter 14 Epilogue Varn had not stayed in the town of Wolfgar, leaving the very next day. They had tried to get him to stay, but he felt it was better to ride off as soon as possible. Staying would only invite trouble for the town, as the king would have tried to send one of his assassins or outright destroy what was left of Wolfgar. He left the axe behind, as it still belonged to Oaken. He had told the old warrior to use it as a symbol for the new Wolfgar and to inspire the people. As normal, he didn't look back as he left. Varn was glad he could see his old friend again, but it was time to move on. He had no clue where he would go next. Zira appeared sitting on the back of Sleepnir. He didn't even look back as she had been bandaged up. Despite wearing the armor, all the hits had left his muscles feeling like they were about to explode. You know, Zira said, you could have stayed just a few days, rested up to heal. No, the longer I stay, the easier it is for that asshole to find me. I am not going to make it easy for him to blindside me. Once I kill the generals, I'm going to personally send him to hell where he belongs. That's what I like about you, Van, she said, giving a devilish grin. You are so driven. The others might think it's vengeance, but I know better. You wish for true justice, don't you? Free of the gods and devils that drive this world. But you, you want to change the scales, don't you? Van didn't bother responding as he kept looking forward at the many miles of roads before him. She started that laughter again, and it bothered him. And what made him more mad was what she said was true. This was his fight, and it was what drove him to rage, to fight as hard as he could, and he would use her power to achieve that dream. She leaned against him and said, oh, You did well though, Van, my Black Knight. You never cease to amaze me. You are unique. A strange anomaly in this world. Not only did you kill that bastard, but you could absorb their essence and become stronger because of it. The question is, will you continue your hunt or shy away from it all? You could just let the world burn. His eyes slanted as he looked back from the corner of his eyes. You don't need to provoke me, you know. I will always fight for the people, and I will have my justice. Of course you will, brother. Jacob said a pair and a sleep neck came to a stop. The black robe wizard stepped forward, petting the side of the horse's face. Such a good boy. I see my brother is still running, you ragged. Lady Kiza, always interesting to see you. Well, if it isn't the brother, I will leave the two of you to talk. 
Another time, little Jacob. And to you, my knight, be safe. You are not allowed to die unless I say so. Kiza said, disappearing as fast as she had appeared. Violet out of sight before looking at his brother, understanding why he had come. I take it the bird already arrived at the castle. I thought I would have much more time to get further away from here. He was very angry at what you did, of course. It was a nice touch leaving your name out of it, even though I am positive he knew you had a hand in it. So, was this one of his generals or just a pawn? And Van nodded and said, It's why I need to get going. If I stay here any longer, no telling what kind of hell will that bastard rain down on them. I'm surprised you were able to make your way here. I thought they were watching you. Ah, they are, but they can't get inside of our home. Not while Kizar protects it. I use that time to slip out to make other arrangements and maintain our secrets. So, where are you headed now? Jacob asked. I think I'm going to head west for a while. Who knows who or what I'll run into? Well, you should try to come home sometime. Before you start to grumble, Mother misses you and you know the secret path from the cave to visit. Speaking of which, I have something for you. The Jacob pulled a cloth item from beneath his cloak and Vaughn caught it. And as he unwrapped the hilt, he saw that it was a single blade sword sheath. And as he drew the elegant curved blade from its sheath, he instantly recognized it as a katana. Is this father's sword? Did you find him? And Jacob shook his head and said, No, but I haven't given up either. And trying to retrieve the records without drawing too much attention to me makes the process go slowly. As far as this blade goes, Huracle knew how to replicate the folding techniques from father's homeland. It's made with the steel as the sword, so your so-called power could flow into it. So, what do you think? Can you master it? Var slid the blade back into its sheath before he strapped it to his saddle, and Var looked at his brother, giving him a cocky grin. Let mother know I miss her. I promise I'll visit soon. Jacob ran a hand along the side of sleep near, as Varn encouraged the mighty steed forward. He could only give a silent prayer as his brother left and mumbled, Good luck, good hunt. And Jacob looked over his shoulder and watched as his brother rode down the road, once again alone. He wished he could join him, but he knew that everyone had a role to play. And for now, his brother's road would be long, dangerous, and spent mostly alone. <sighs> Good luck, Van. You'll need it. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest pounding, enthralling, and lovable characters there. From the incredible mind of KB Michaels, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. Massive thank you, Michael, for allowing me to narrate this incredible story of yours. I really hope you've enjoyed this process as much as I, and thank you ever so much for trusting me with your adventure that I know so many people are enjoying. Well, Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why well, it really does help both the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Critted Crew. Now if you think you can pen the next big hit and knock something out with this calibre of writing, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really look forward to hearing from you I hope everyone's well and happy this week fighting fit and taking a fight back to life and are enjoying the beautiful summer sunshine but above all guys remember be safe not sorry And another one, and another one, and another, another one. Uh, not only was he successful, not only was he a successful practitioner in the arts of magic, but he was a skilled. Not only was he, 
Was he? Was I? What? A, oh, 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 oh. Not only was he a successful practitioner in the arts of magic, but he was a skilled. But he was a skilled. But he was a. But he was a. But he was a skilled strategist. Strategist. Wake up, you cunt! After riding hard most of the he had one little bit, but he had. He had heard once his. He had heard. <laughs> Don't worry though. The beast had left him with his two men. He had guessed and couldn't understand why the soldiers. The beast had left him with his two men and he had guessed. The beast had left him with his two men, he had guessed. The beast had left him with his two men, he had guessed. He could be just as strong as any of them. An image of a man flashed his mind. A young man with long red hair. And those eyes mismatched eyes. And those eyes mismatched eyes that stared at him. And the words telling him how. And the words telling him how.